But now it is. Um, we're scheduled to start at six, so just you know where I is on the clock. We're going to give people five more minutes, and then we're going to get started. And for those joining us with the live stream, bear with us five more minutes, and then we'll get started.
Hi, everybody. Do you mind grabbing a seat? We're going to get started. Yelena, do you mind closing one of those doors at the back? Welcome uh, to this public update briefing on uh, Waterfront Toronto's Keyside project. Just before we get started, I want to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Nicole Swern and I'll be your facilitator tonight. But to get us started, I'd like to invite uh, local councillor Joe Cressy, as well as Waterfront Toronto board member, to uh, give some opening remarks. Uh, well, thank you, Nicole. Um, maybe just before kicking it off, this is a first for me. Uh, this is my first night out of the house in 11 days, as my wife and I just had our first child 11 days ago. Um, it's, it's, that's very nice applause. I'm going to use that line everywhere going forward. <laughs> it's also a first because this is the first time I've spoken publicly on exactly 72 minutes sleep in the last 48 hours. So I'll give it a go. Uh, listen, when I think about the waterfront, and you're here, you care deeply about our waterfront, is... Our city began as a waterfront city. It was our poor point of origin, and we lost it. We lost the waterfront over a century to an elevated expressway. We lost the waterfront to a railway. We lost the waterfront to industrialization, uh, and we lost it to complicated ownership where governments and couldn't get it to themselves together to figure out what to do. Uh, in recent decades, I think under the leadership of Waterfront Toronto, we finally begun to reclaim our place as a waterfront city. That's who we should be, that's who we are. And so when I think about Keyside, Keyside has to be the next step in waterfront revitalization. And when I think about Keyside, both as a, the local city councillor, but also as a member of the board, I think the opportunity that we must meet is to build a new 21st century neighborhood that is affordable, that is sustainable, and that is livable. That's the opportunity. There are also big risks. Uh, how many of you have been to a previous public meeting on, on the Keyside proposal? Put up your hands if you've been to any. A lot of you. So if you've been to one before, or if you've uh, looked at it online or read the newspapers, you will know we had a big proposal that came in in June, a uh, master innovation development plan come from Sidewalk Labs. And I can tell you, it was my perspective, and for many at the board as well at Waterfront Toronto, that the proposal asked for too much. It asked for too much land, it asked for too much control over data, it asked for too much control over governance. And based on, I think, really detailed public review and feedback, many of you have given it, as well as at Waterfront Toronto from our staff, we've seen significant changes. And you're going to hear about those changes here tonight. So how do we move forward? I think we have two things in front of us. On the one hand, we have to make sure that in looking at changes and a new proposal that will come, that we mitigate risk. We have to be aware of risks and mitigate them on everything from governance to scope to accountability. But then we also need to focus on objectives and our opportunity. How do we build a truly livable and affordable neighborhood? How do we set a positive precedent on both of those metrics? How do we design a carbon neutral neighborhood to tackle the climate crisis? And how do we think about data and digital governance from the perspective of becoming the most private smart city in the world? How do we do that? And so tonight is the next step in what has been a long process. It is a long process, it is a tough process, but I'll tell you having overseen many developments on public and private land, uh, we could have just gone the easy way. We could have just found a development partner and you build a certain amount of affordable housing and it's mixed use and you have some nice urban design and we all go on. But I think the waterfront deserves more than that. 
I think to revitalize the waterfront, we need to do better than that. So as we review this between now and the end of March, let's build that sustainable and affordable neighborhood. Thank you very much. Great, so what I'll do is just orient you to um, the agenda for tonight and just a bit on the role of our team. So um, we are here as 30 party facilitators. We work with a company called Swern, it's also my last name. Um, and we work only for governments and public actors. And we work to better connect decision makers to the communities they serve and the constituencies they serve. And it's in that spirit that Waterfront Toronto retained us to help seek public feedback on what had been proposed by Sidewalk Labs. And we were um, first involved in the public consultation on this project back in July. So while Councillor Cressy identified those who had been involved previously, I'm gonna ask the reverse. Who hasn't, who's first time in here at this project? Put your hands straight up so we get a sense. So maybe 10%, okay, welcome. Um, we have a lot of documentation of what's happened before, and that's also part of the responsibility of our team. You won't see us advocating for a particular outcome for this project, nor any of the projects we work on. That's not our job. Our job is to try and create the space for many different voices to try and come together and understand each other, and for public actors, to help public actors try and find the common ground um, among those different voices, if that ground is to be found. It's a great burden of public uh, service a great opportunity uh, as well we know um, so the plan for tonight um, is and if you just on your way in you would have picked up a one-page agenda is really to start with a briefing so uh, a combination of um, George Zagarek who's the CEO of Waterfront Toronto is probably the first time many of you are meeting him as well as Meg Davis Christina Verner and Eric Cunningham Cunnington sorry um, will be presenting um, a really uh, comprehensive briefing on what's happened in the last, uh, even the last few weeks. Uh, it's probably just three weeks now, I think, since the end of October, where that was a major threshold um, point in this entire process, and they're gonna brief you on it. Um, as they're talking, you might have some questions. And on the back of your agenda, there's a place to write those down. So you might wanna take some notes as they're going through, because we'll ask you to hold your questions um, until they're finished. And in order to work through the, the number of questions we expect to get, we have a bit of a strategy for doing that, and I'll, I'll brief you on that um, when we're through the presentations. But at, just to start, um, if you have any questions, you wanna make a note of them, again, you can use the back of your agenda. Also, if you leave this behind, we'll make sure that any of the questions you've listed um, get into the documentation from today, and anything that's not answered today, Waterfront Toronto commits to answering um, before we get the final report to you, and you'll have another week or so to go home and think about it. So if you're watching from afar, we're also live streaming and recording, so the documentation from today will also be available um, in uh, video form on the, on the Waterfront Toronto YouTube page. Um, so just before I turn it over to uh, George um, to set some remarks, I wanted to also flag um, some materials that you may or may not have seen already if you've been following how this unfolds. Um, the first is on October 29th, George um, uh, Zagarek from Waterfront Toronto wrote a letter to Sidewalk Labs outlining what would happen with resolution of the threshold issues. And also, so that's part of your package. There's also an 11 by 17 that's sort of a cheat sheet that um, lines down the left all of the issues that were outstanding um, at that time and how those issues, the realignment of those issues on the right. There's also a two-page open letter from the Waterfront Toronto board chair, um, Steve Diamond, in your package as well. And in the spirit of trying to have a take-home that um, uh, summarizes all of this, there's also a four-page public update. So it says describes the alignment on the critical issues, gives a few highlights on what has changed, talks about what we heard from the public back in July and how that connects to the resolution of the threshold issues, and then how that influences what Waterfront Toronto will actually be evaluating now that rather than sort of the big MIDP document, um, you will hear that there's a, a scoped back, um, as the councillor said, scoped back uh, proposal on the table. 
Um, and then how has the process been updated is on the back. And for those who follow us um, very closely, you'll know that we had um, a process diagram when we started and we've updated it as a result of um, the last uh, three weeks of activity. So we'll go through all that in more detail, but if you want to glance at it while the presentations are unfolding, you'll know you've got it there as a reference. So just before I turn it over um, to the presenters, give me a sense of who uses the waterfront. I'd be surprised if somebody didn't put their hand up, but good. How many live or work on the waterfront? Okay, so hold them for a second. That's about almost half the room. Okay, great. Um, and we already know how many people were here before, so we have a few new folks and lots of people who've seen it before, uh, earlier stages in this process. So what I'm gonna do um, is hand it straight over to George um, and uh, welcome him as the incoming CEO since August. So uh, I think this is his first public appearance in this kind of venue. So welcome, George. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, is Joe Cressy still here? Or is he? Oh, there he is. You know what, uh, Joe, I have to say, somebody who's got a baby just, what, 11 days ago, you said? Uh, to be here to, to commit, uh, and you've committed to Waterfront all the way through, but now you have another screaming body looking for you. <laughs> so I know Joe's going to have to leave uh, or find a lawyer for his wife. So this is uh, extremely, I think, uh, hospitable in the terms of your efforts to actually support us. And I want to thank you as a board member. Um, I'm just, I don't know if Kevin Sullivan, any of the other board members here? I just want to acknowledge if they were here. No. So I'm going to just, uh, actually Joe used part of my speech, so I'll cut this down a little bit shorter, um, and, and the team will walk you through uh, the journey we've been on and brief you. Um, I do want to acknowledge the time that you're taking out. Uh, I know we had consultations earlier, uh, but to come to this briefing to get informed as to where we're at and what's in the letters and what does it actually mean uh, is important to us. Uh, your input and your feedback has been important throughout this process and I just want to thank you for coming out tonight. I'm going to just give you a little bit, as Nicole said, uh, actually, I think it's three months exactly today that I took over uh, the role of CEO, and I'm thrilled to uh, be part of this organization, to have uh, the team that I have, to have uh, a reputable organization which has really uh, an outstanding uh, staff and have taken on innovations for the last 20 years. Um, but to have this kind of compelling mandate uh, is why I think we're all in this room. Um, just a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I'm new in this role uh, the last uh, three months, but I'm not new to the waterfront, uh, at Toronto Waterfront. I have worked with the Toronto Waterfront throughout my career, uh, 33 years with the province, 11 as the deputy minister in five different portfolios. I was the Deputy Minister of Infrastructure, which was responsible for uh, all the infra infrastructure planning for the province, um, also the realty, uh, but also responsible for Waterfront Toronto and, uh, and Infrastructure Ontario. Um, it has been great uh, to be now part of the organization and to work with the community. The one thing I want to acknowledge is the reputation Waterfront Toronto has had right from the beginning of engaging the community. Uh, and that goes right back uh, to the credit uh, of Bob Fong and uh, John Campbell. Uh, and I just want to commit myself uh, to continuing that reputation of moving with the community and engaging the community as we move forward. So that's, I think, enough uh, about uh, myself in terms of the background. I do want to touch on, you know, our uh, real reputation is uh, uh, validated by the community itself. And uh, I do want to acknowledge one issue that came up just prior to October 31st in the media, and we had a, a chance to discuss this with our panels and others, but I did want to publicly address this issue. There was some media reports about engagement uh, with the Indigenous groups just before the 31st deadline, um, and I do want to update you on what happened during that period. So we uh, have always worked with the Indigenous groups on the waterfront, uh, on our Portland's project. We continue to work with the Mississaugas and the, uh, the Credit, and uh, they actually are part of that project, actually doing some of the archaeological uh, oversight on the project. 
We have continued to work with them, uh, so we were surprised by some of the media attention, and we got a letter back from uh, the Miss Saga's uh, the credit, and I did want to just read to you what the response was to clarify this. Um, as the rightful treaty, treaty holders of the land of which the Keysai project is proposed, <coughs> excuse me, the Massagas of the Credit First Nation has been consulted by both Waterfront Toronto and Sidewalk Labs directly since the announcement of the project. While we understand that no decision has yet been made regarding the project, we look forward to ongoing and deep consultation into the future. So since we weren't able to publicly address that, I thought it was really important for me to acknowledge that uh, in this session. Uh, tonight's meeting is really about the future of Keyside, and it's important to know that this has really been a long-standing issue. Uh, for the last 20 years, uh, it's been planned, to be frank. Uh, it was envisioned uh, by the task force back in 1999 about dealing with uh, the Don River, uh, some of the floodplain issues, and developments along the waterfront. Uh, so this has been phased over a period of time. Uh, waterfronts played a role in uh, addressing some of these issues to ensure that we can actually develop with the vision that was actually established uh, back in 1999. Um, and I, I have to be proud to uh, say I'm very proud that we've stuck to that vision. Over a 20 year period, if you look back to what we've been asked to do uh, and was acknowledged back then, and it's up there right now. Um, you know, it was to create major new neighborhoods for working and living and recreation, resulting in substantial increase in the affordable housing, uh, creating a convergence in the community that crosses disciplines, and included, you know, uh, the strengths of the uh, new media, communications, music, biotechnology, and technology along that waterfront, and to establish a corporation separate from government that oversaw this development. We've delivered on all those things. And when you look at some of the work that was done earlier uh, to really release the opportunity of our, our lands, just actually north uh, a little bit, which was actually the design work on Corktown um, Common. Uh, and that was critical to basically uh, continue to support the floodplains uh, uh, adaptation so that we can actually develop East Bayfront and the lands in that area. We're doing the same thing, quite frankly, with Portland's project. So we've done this before. The Portland's project is critical because, quite frankly, without the work that's being done there, we wouldn't be having this conversation of developing uh, the Portland's. So I think one of the things that, you know, we'll get into a little more detail with the staff. They'll walk you through what was in the letter, uh, what our response, and how we're moving forward. And I just want to acknowledge, as Joe did, you know, this is, you know, an opportunity for us to, you know, develop a community, to use technology to actually help achieve inclusive, dynamic, and climate-positive communities. Uh, how do we use technology in a way that actually supports the vision of the three levels of government and of the community? And that's the dialogue that we're having uh, with you and our government partners as well. And we want to thank you again for coming out tonight. I'm going to turn over the mic to Meg, our... Chief, uh, or am I coming back to you, Nicole? Well, I, I only forgot to introduce a few people. So I'm okay. Do that quickly. Okay, and she's going to introduce Meg. Yes, so thank exactly. you very much. I only wanted to say quickly, I missed the fact there are a few, uh, a number of Waterfront Toronto folks in the room. So I wanted to put your hands up just to let people know the Waterfront Toronto team is here. The City of Toronto also has folks here. There's at least two or three, maybe hands straight up so they see you. Yeah, there's Mike and oh, a whole bunch. So there's about 10 folks from the City of Toronto. Sidewalk Labs also has a couple people here to listen straight at the back. Um, and I should have done that when I got everybody else to put their hands up. So now, without any further ado, Meg Davis, Chief Development Officer, um, to uh, continue the briefing. Thanks, Nicole, and thanks, George, for your inaugural address. Um, I also want to recognize um, uh, Adam Vaughn, our local MP, is here, and Paula Fletcher, our local councillor, has also joined us somewhere. If you want to just raise your hand so we can see. There you are. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, let me just... 
So when we issued the RFP for Keyside, we issued a challenged-based RFP. And we um, focused on four key objectives, so creating the next uh, sort of level of sustainable um, development, urban development, um, creating a complete community with all income levels, uh, land use types, et cetera, as well as um, creating a test bed for local and Canadian uh, technology firms to try and grow and go to scale, and then to find partners to help us with that vision. And those guiding um, objectives are based on our mandate as the steward of the waterfront. And it's allowed us to um, look at the potential of creating a precedent-setting um, uh, project that will be a demonstration to the rest of the world. Um, Christina and Eric are going to talk a little bit more about how those objectives um, found their way into our, our evaluation that we're about to undertake. Um, as Nicole mentioned, on, uh, and I think Joe also mentioned this, on June 24th, we released to the public um, Sidewalk Lab's proposal, the Master Innovation and Development Plan, which we call the MIDP. And in that, we saw some potential, some exciting ideas um, that really addressed the challenges that we put out in our RFP. We also had some concerns about how those might be implemented on Keyside. And through uh, an open letter from our board chair, Steve Diamond, um, he identified some of those threshold issues and we set a date of October 31st to resolve those threshold issues. And just at a high level, the issues that, um, that we identified were that the idea district of 190 acres was bigger than um, what was proposed in the RFP and was um, premature. We needed to see things happening on Keyside first. Um, that Sidewalk would be the lead developer, which was not anticipated in the RFP. That transit would be a condition for Sidewalk moving forward. And there was a proposal for some new public entities that um, we had some concerns around that. And then finally, we needed more detail on um, data use and collection so we could see whether or not they matched with Canadian uh, law um, going forward. So we, um, along with our note to reader, we issued all of that to the public and we held, um, with Nicole's help through the summer, uh, a variety of public consultations and I suspect a lot of people in this room participated. And we heard really three voices in that consultation. The first was the supportive voice, those who saw some potential in the innovations that were being presented. And then some who were you know, firmly against and saw a lot of risk in what was being proposed. And then there was sort of a middle ground group, cautious maybes, um, who thought, okay, there look like there's some opportunities, but there are some significant risks here that need to be dealt with. And in order to deal with those, they set a number of conditions or articulated a number of conditions um, if we were to move forward. So limiting the geography to the 12 acres of Keyside, um, ensuring that there is prompt, uh, strong public control and oversight, ensuring there's control over all um, data governance, and then making sure that there was a good deal financially for Toronto and for Canada. And all of those uh, comments came from the public but were also echoed by our digital strategy advisory panel and by our board. And all of that feedback, feedback helped us come to resolution of those threshold issues that I mentioned. So on October 31st, which is just a few weeks ago, as Nicole mentioned, our board voted unanimously to go ahead with the formal evaluation of the MIDP based on the re resolution to the threshold issues. And Eric's going to take you, Eric and Christine are going to take you through that in a little bit more detail. Um, and that realignment really was based on um, public feedback as well as um, our various panels and advisors. So we were happy to get to resolution on those issues, but we're not, we haven't done a deal yet. Um, we have a lot of work still to be done with your help. And, um, you know, we will go together with uh, Eric and Christina down the next uh, stages of work that we're going to take um, uh, from now until March 31st. So I'm going to introduce uh, Christina, our Vice President of Prosperity, Sustainability and Innovation, and Eric Cunnington, our Director of Development. Hello. Hello, Eric. <laughs> this is feeling a little bit like the Academy Awards. <laughs> Do you want the clicker? Sure. Uh, so, as Meg mentioned, we're going to go through. Uh, you can all hear me. I guess the mic's pretty sensitive. I'm not standing right in front of it, but everybody's good. Good. Stand closer. Then I will stand closer. <laughs> Does this work? Uh, oh, perfect. 
Uh, so we're going to go through the resolution of the threshold issues, uh, of the 10 issues, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the process from now until, uh, well, to the end of the, to, from now until March, and then from March till December 2020. Uh, so, how does the clicker work? Big green button. Big green button. Very technical. That's why I'm here. <laughs> All right, so you, you'll recall from uh, our briefings and for those of you who have read the MIDP uh, that originally Sidewalk Labs proposed an idea district of 190 acres with various roles for themselves inside that geography. And the realignment that we have uh, agreed on is that the project will be focused on the 12 acres and with the opportunity to expand. That opportunity to expand is uh, focused on they need to uh, perform or we need to perform on Keyside. Keyside needs to perform as a project. And then any expansion would be uh, require the processes of the landholders that it could expand to. And the city of Toronto has been very clear that if it expands, the project expands to Villiers West, it would require a, proc a competitive procurement process. And so uh, in the packages that you have received in the letter, I believe the city's letter is appended to the back of that. So if you want to have a deeper look at that. And then this one's for Christina. So as Meg noted in the MIDP, there was a series of different public administrators that were noted. And in there, you had things like the Open Space Alliance, the Urban Data Trust, the Waterfront Housing Trust, the Sustainability Association, and a Transportation Management Association. Now, all of those, uh, while they had benefits to them in terms of perhaps innovations that could be brought to the governance process, the realignment resulted in the fact that the, all future work would be done through existing public bodies with the addition of perhaps some government task forces to help work through some of the more challenging aspects of the proposal in an efficient way. Transit. So in the MIDP, uh, they said that transit was a must-have condition, i.e. they would not proceed without it, sidewalk wouldn't. And uh, Waterfront Toronto has always been a supporter of uh, transit on the waterfront, and we continue to be so. We're working with the city and Metrolinx to try and advance that uh, delivery of the transit. Uh, but we are not in a position to determine the funding allocation for it, and so we make no, we will take no liability for the transit if it does not arrive, no liability to Sidewalk Labs. Also, uh, Sidewalk Labs has until December 31st, 2020, to be satisfied for the prospects of transit, and so that date will make a little more sense as we talk about the process going forward, but basically the high-level takeaway is that should we come to an agreeable plan by March 31st, 2020, then we will uh, Waterfront Toronto and Sidewalk Labs will try and outline some impl implementation agreements. And those implementation agreements, the target deadline is for December 31st, 2020. So if we reach those agreements and we enter into those agreements, then we are moving forward with the project and the uh, project will no longer be conditional on that or it will have, that issue will have been satisfied. Oh, this one's still me. Uh, vertical developer. So again, in the MIDP, we talked a little bit a second ago about the idea district, and uh, Sidewalk Labs proposed that they would be the lead developer in Keyside and also in Villiers West. Um, and the, uh, the realignment is that Waterfront Toronto will competitively procure development teams with Sidewalk Labs support to partner with Sidewalk Labs going forward. So it is not, uh, in the MIDP they said, we're going to be the vertical developer, and we're saying, no, we need to do a developer call. Waterfront Toronto will lead a developer call uh, to move that issue forward. So one of the new elements of this project over some of the other developments that Waterfront Toronto has undertaken in the past is really the intersection of digital elements on top of the development proposals. And really looking at the details that will be required for us to fulfill the, uh, the evaluation process and determine whether or not these proposals would be compliant with all of the Canadian uh, legislative and regulatory frameworks, there was a bit of a, a gap in terms of the information that was delivered to us in the Master Innovation and Development Plan. And this was something that, as Meg said, was reinforced not just through the letter from uh, Steve Diamond, but also through the work of the Digital Strategy Advisory Panel. 
So through the realignment process, we were able to secure a number of different clarifications from Sidewalk Labs. Most importantly is that all of the uh, data protections and data governance regulations that exist today and will exist in the future from our three levels of government will actually be the guiding framework for this project. There will be no exemptions to that particular proposal or to that particular framework in order to bring this to life. Personal data collected in Keyside will be stored in Canada. And this is something that goes back to the very first public meeting that we had as a concern that was raised by the public. And we've heard you and Sidewalk heard you when this is a commitment that they have made to this project. The term urban data, which doesn't exist in the Canadian construct, has also been removed from their proposal. And their proposal has been reasserted in something called the Digital Innovation Appendix in a way that actually conforms to Canadian legal constructs and is now available to be read and, and referred to through the Canadian legislative lens. And the notion of the Urban Data Trust, albeit there were some beneficial aspects to the, the notion of data sharing and enhancing how data could be shared with the ecosystem, has also been removed because it actually overlaid too much of a governance role for Sidewalk Labs in addition to the data sharing role. All of this was actually conveyed to us in the Digital Innovation Appendix from Sidewalk Labs, which provided an additional uh, body of work uh, which goes into a far greater detail of what data they're looking to collect and what types of technologies either Sidewalk or potential partners uh, that they may be looking to bring on later on would bring to bear on the project through their digital innovation appendix that was published last Friday. I have my own microphone now. You have your own microphone. <laughs> but you, right. can have, you don't Very. have your own clicker. Yeah. Uh, so roles and responsibilities. Uh, in the MIDP, Sidewalk Labs identified a number of roles for themselves regarding implementation for infrastructure, uh, as well as an advisory service role related to the innovation and planning. And the realignment is that Waterfront Toronto will lead all uh, municipal infrastructure, the design, uh, planning, and implementation, and funding. and. Uh, for the advanced infrastructure, Sidewalk Labs will lead the implementation in accordance with the innovation plan. We haven't touched on the innovation plan yet, so that'll make a bit more sense uh, as we move towards the end of the presentation, and uh, subject to WT review and approval. Land value. So that was not one of the issues that was identified in, the, in Steve's letter, but it's something that we needed to align on. And, uh, so Waterfront Toronto always begins its uh, valuation of uh, lands uh, based on fair market value at the time of transaction uh, in order to ensure the best value for the public. And so the current fair market value for Keyside is $590 million, uh, assuming fully serviced land. And um, another point that we need to make on this is that we haven't determined the time of transaction. So between now and whenever that time is, the land value could vary. Another area that was not necessarily a part of Steve Diamond's letter, but that we were able to get additional clarification on, is the ecosystem development. So for those of you who are familiar with the process, you may recall that one of the RFP objectives surrounded economic development and prosperity, and really looking at how the Keyside project could become an opportunity for the local ecosystem to be able to take products to scale and demonstrate a significance to the world uh, and help to overcome some barriers that the Canadian tech ecosystem t traditionally has had. So Sidewalk Labs had made commitments to intellectual property and investments into the local ecosystem, and this was another area that we felt we needed some additional clarification on. In the realignment, there is more clarity in terms of how the venture capital fund will be structured, that there will be a local partner to help them deploy that venture capital fund, and begin to understand a bit more of what future investments into a venture capital strategy may look like from Sidewalk Labs. In addition, the Urban Innovation Institute, which would be a multidisciplinary, multi-jurisdictional, and, and multi-institutional research in, uh, institute, applied research institute, would have a business plan that would be developed by both Waterfront Toronto and Sidewalk Labs is it something that Waterfront Toronto has actually been trying to bring to life along the waterfront back in 2006 and looking forward, and we've been looking to find a partner that can help us to fund that and set that institute up. Another key area, and this is by far going to be the most complicated area for us to navigate through in the next phase, is around intellectual property and data ownership. So in the original proposal, Sidewalk Labs had a Canadian-based patent pledge that would apply so that sidewalk innovations that were registered here in Canada in terms of their patents being filed 
would be unlocked for Canadian innovators to be able to actually develop on top of those without having a fear of having uh, legal repercussions by Sidewalk later on. We asked for that to be made global, which Sidewalk has agreed to. We also, in the original proposal, Sidewalk had put forward that they were willing to share revenues from their IP that they developed for the Keyside project that was deployed here through the testbed with Waterfront Toronto. And they had indicated that they were looking at doing a 10% profit sharing, 10% uh, share based on profit for 10 years. We thought that this should be based on net revenues. For any, we have yet to determine both the percentage and the period of time, but Sidewalk has agreed to realign based on net revenues. That makes it easier for us to be able to account for and have more transparency on how those transactions are happening. And also, we were able to get clarification that all of the great work that has happened over the last 18 months, Waterfront Toronto has access to the intellectual property that has been developed for the actual master innovation and development plan for the Keyside project, regardless of whether or not we choose to move forward with Sidewalk Labs. So the last one that we're going to touch on is uh, Waterfront, Waterfront Toronto Investments. And so we need to understand how Waterfront Toronto would be willing to fund its policy objectives. Waterfront Toronto has a number of policy objectives, such as sustainability and affordable housing, amongst others. And um, Waterfront Toronto has always, through some process, uh, funded, been a funder of those uh, of our projects and, and those policy objectives. So uh, we need to determine, and moving forward, how we would fund uh, this project, uh, and you can see that affordable housing, sustainability, and innovation are among some of the top things that we'd be looking to fund, uh, aligned with our mandate. And um, to the extent that Waterfront Toronto uh, has funding, we'll fund those objectives, and to the extent that we do not have funding and believe that other objectives are aligned with our policy mandate, we would try to work with the other orders of government in order to bring funding forward. So next steps in the evaluation process. I think I'm going to hand it over to Christina. Great. Thanks, Eric. We'll be a little bit less back and forth in this next section. Um, so we are going to talk a little bit about, first of all, what is being evaluated. And this has been a question that we've been hearing quite a bit is, okay, so now that the project has been scoped down, what is still actually relevant for people to be reading and reviewing and attempting to understand? So we want to try and clarify for you tonight what is still within the scope of, of sort of materials that are relevant for you to be working through if you're interested in continuing to follow through with the project with what's happening. So with the realignment letter and the smaller scope, the three volumes of the MIDP uh, have relevant pieces still within them that are, are worth you taking a peek at. In volume one, which was really the plans around the actual physical development of the site, there is a section in there that's dedicated to Keyside and that is the actual portion that we would still be going through and working through the evaluation on. On volume two, which is the innovations chapter, or the innovations volume, we would be looking at how those innovations relate to the Keyside geography, and also looking at the restated digital elements that are articulated in the digital innovation appendix. For volume three, which looked at the partnership, the vast majority of the information in volume three is no longer relevant because that dealt with a number of the issues that were resolved through the threshold issues uh, process. That being said, there are still elements related to the Venture Capital Fund and the Urban Innovation Institute that live within that volume that would be worth looking into. Um, as well, certain things like the commercial terms, roles and responsibilities, those will be provided in terms of clarification in future documents that will be created by Waterfront Toronto. Additional materials will be considered as part of that evaluation process, including, as I mentioned, the digital innovation appendix and things like the public consultation report that was also issued last week. Now I want to walk you through the process overview of what's going to happen in the next phase as we move forward. This, this diagram should look quite familiar to you. You've seen it in the earlier rounds of consultation. Um, and some things have changed as a result of where the threshold issues landed and the process that we've undertaken with the October 31st deadline. So this is what you saw in July, and we are, are still working through a similar process, but with some new additions. So with that, the very first new change to this is really the addition of this public update to explain where we actually landed on the threshold issues. So this does not replace the... Um, second consultation, it's in addition to. And there is an easier to read version in your four page handout that is, is available to you on your table. Right on the back. Thank you, George. 
So what we're also completing at the present time is the technical evaluation of the proposal that was put forward as amended by the threshold issues letter. So that's Waterfront Toronto and its subject matter experts completing an independent technical evaluation on the proposal. Eric's going to provide you with a bit more detail on that in a minute. Now, if that proposal has enough merit to move forward, you'll see there's a little triangle or a, a diamond shape in a number of these different areas. That blue diamond indicates a decision point for us. So if there's enough merit to move forward, what will happen as part of that evaluation is Waterfront Toronto will produce the first version of both an innovation plan of the things that meet our objectives and goals, as well as the first version of the development plan for the Keyside project. And the alternative is, if there isn't enough merit, we wouldn't produce that innovation plan and the process would stop. You'll also then see that as part of that with the uh, innovation plan and development plan version one, the second round of public consultation in January would take place. So we'll bring that all forward with the outcome of the evaluation and those draft uh, submissions or draft plans for your consideration in January. Based on the consultation and the feedback from groups like the Digital Strategy Advisory Panel, if there is enough merit to move forward, there would be a second version of both the innovation plan and the development plan, as well as the beginning of those commercial terms that we would then take to our board for consideration in March of 2020 for the board to make a decision on whether or not to direct Waterfront Toronto to proceed to commercial negotiations with Sidewalk Labs. And then the rest of that proposal or that proposed process is similar to what you've seen in earlier rounds of consultation. And I'll hand it to Eric to talk about evaluation. So I'm going to talk a bit about the evaluation and a bit about the process from here to March, not after that. So this uh, slide here is the evaluation process, and so it probably is familiar to Sorry, I was wondering if someone was asking a question. Um, it, wondering whether it's familiar to most of you because it's, we have presented it before. Um, so it starts at the, the evaluation process, starts at the bottom. And so we have the design review panel, public gov and governmental consultation, and the digital strategy advisory panel. And then that information is uh, passed up through to the, the pillar evaluation with the, it says there's SMEs, those are subject matter experts. Uh, I get across the eight uh, pillars, so sustainability, buildings, public realm, uh, and each one of those has a lead at Waterfront Toronto, and we're using uh, the, the subject matter experts to get make sure that we have uh, world-renowned expertise on these issues. Um, and so each one of those issues is reviewed, and um, then the next level up is the development plan. So the development plan has two ways of thinking about it. There is the physical development plan and its comparison to the existing planning documents such as the Central, wa Central Waterfront Secondary Plan and the Precinct Plan for... Um, uh, Councillor Fletcher, you have a question. We don't have the copy. Oh, you don't have a copy of this. No, we, I don't think we have copies of this available. Uh, but they are, this whole thing is on the website and we'll be happy to put this presentation online afterwards. Um, so the development plan, uh, I was saying that there's two ways of reviewing it. There's one when you compare it to the existing planning documents and the other way of understanding it is um, the, the, uh, the pillar evaluations. A lot of those things have physical implementation. So if you take the example of a digital curb, if that's something that we think is worth uh, implementing, then it has a place in the, the physical plan and it has space that it needs to take up. And so we need to think about the, the physical plan from that point of view. And then we uh, move on to the commercial evaluation. Uh, as Christina pointed out, a lot of the issues in the commercial evaluation um, in the MIDP will not be considered, but there are things that do need to be considered, as she pointed out, and, and one of them is um, what's the best way to partner with uh, Sidewalk Labs. And, the risks and rewards around that. And then finally, all of that information is passed up to the evaluation committee. The evaluation committee will make a recommendation to uh, IREC, which is the Investment Real Estate and Keyside Committee, which is a subcommittee of our board. So many acronyms, I'm sorry. Um, and then any uh, decision or um, 
recommendation that IREC makes to the board of directors will then uh, go through uh, using WT management, uh, go through the government process to make sure that they are aware of what's happening. So that's the evaluation process, and so I want to now talk a bit about the criteria. Again, this may be familiar to some of you. This was originally presented at the roundtable number four, almost a year ago now, and so I'm just going to touch on the high levels, but again, there is information on, uh, on our website. There's a, a deep dive on this, but the, what we have done is identified a number of goals and objectives for the project, which would be uh, I think George identified at the beginning of our presentation some of the things that are uh, in our mandate, and then Meg pointed out the goals and objectives of the RFP, and so these things that you're looking at here should also be familiar because they're aligned with that. So the top, uh, uh, the, the priority outcomes, which are the top five things, are job creation and economic development, sustainability and climate positive development, housing affordability, new mobility, and urban innovation, and all of that um, as Christina has already touched on, I think in this presentation needs to be overseen by a robust data privacy and digital governance uh, process. Um, and so I think that's still very much at a high level. And so I want to take you through this, take a few minutes to go through this slide, which is um, detailed, but I think it's important to walk through carefully for two reasons. One, it'll give you a better understanding of how the evaluation is happening, and two, the process or the output that we are going to present to you in January will follow something along these lines. It may not look exactly like this, but it'll uh, follow this process. That's why it says draft on there, so you know that you might not see exactly this, but something along these lines. And so this is the evaluation uh, dashboard for sustainability. And so the MIDP has approximately 50 innovations or initiatives uh, that are dedicated to sustainability, and you can see the six uh, sub-issues in sustainability, climate positive, exemplary green building standards, sustainable mobility, affordable utilities, and circular, circular economy and resilient infrastructure. And so those 50 initiatives uh, will all be analyzed by and uh, reviewed by the subject matter experts and the Waterfront Toronto staff, and then in order to think about how to rate those 50, Waterfront Toronto has this nine by nine, or sorry, three by three matrix, the nine squares that are on the left of the slide there. So um, the things that are higher on the slide or in the matrix are uh, higher in eff uh, efficacy, and things that as you move from, uh, what is that, move left to right um, are either uh, more or uh, have either higher or, or lower concerns associated with them. So if you take the example of the, the uh, top, the top left, I'm trying to get oriented. It's working really hard to justify this project right now. I'm trying, what I'm trying to do is dig into the evaluation process and give you an understanding of how it works. And it's, it's technical. It's very technical and detailed, and I think that that's appropriate. So rating the initiatives or innovations, the top left ones are the highest effective with minor concerns. So those are things that should be, you should do those things. There. Sure. Yeah, sorry that it's so fuzzy. So, yeah. The, uh, I don't know sure that I'm going to read them all out, but basically what it says is that the, the things on the matrix that are in the top left are highly effective with low concerns, and things that are in the top, bottom right are low effective with major concerns. And so you don't want to do the things that are low effective with major concerns. And a, a lot of the evaluation is going to be focused on things that are um, high effectiveness with major concerns. Let's think about those in a detailed way, because we, don't, we, should, we need to come forward and present all of the issues that are high effectiveness with major concerns, with minor concerns. 
Uh, but just concerns? Yeah. Oh, Waterfront Toronto's concerns. Anyhow, I th think that you get the idea about how the evaluation will work and how we'll bring forward the information to you in January of 2020. And so that information and the outputs of that process are what make up the innovation plan that we mentioned earlier. So the things that we believe are uh, going to work and aren't too risky, those things should be on the innovation plan. Things that are, uh, don't have high impact, those things shouldn't be on the innovation plan. And so the first draft of the innovation plan will come out from the technical evaluation and be presented to uh, both the evaluation committee and the public in uh, January of 2020. And then we'll take that feedback uh, from both the public and from our experts, such as the Digital Strategy Advisory Panel, in order to make a second draft of the plan. So should we successfully reach a, um, an agreed upon innovation plan, a development plan, and commercial terms, we will go forward to our board with recommendations and these things will be attached. Should we not reach a successful understanding of what these things are, then we will make a different recommendation to our board. And I think that that takes us from the evaluation through to a board recommendation. We're almost done. I'm just going to recap the overall process to make sure that everyone has clarity about what happened up until this point and how we're moving forward and what those steps look like and we'll be coming back to the public just to understand what is being delivered at what points in time. So again, we are in the public update, which happens, of course, in November. We are also going through our technical evaluation process to determine what elements, if any, of the MIDP are aligned with our objectives and have merit to make their way into a draft innovation plan that would be brought forward to the public consultation that would be happening in January uh, for you to provide feedback and additional insight into. That if that is a process that has merit, we'll continue to move forward into a second portion of our second version of the innovation plan that would then be brought forward with the development plan and the commercial terms to our board for a decision in March of 2020. And again, the board has a decision to make in March of 2020 on whether or not to direct Waterfront Toronto to negotiate um, implementation agreements. Those implementation agreements would be based on that plan, the innovation and development plan that you've seen at that point. And it would be part of um, the, the discussions that we would then have to also have with our government partners. And by December the 2020, the goal would be to have uh, preliminary implementation agreements that would be able to guide a process moving forward if all of these other elements are satisfied in the earlier stages where there's decision points that have to be satisfied as well. So I'm gonna hand it back to Nicole just to wrap up this portion and start the Q&A section. The City of Toronto wanted uh, to flag, um, and we're just tucking it in the end, they thought it, it might be useful for me to cover, um, that they will be doing consultations on a digital, developing a digital infrastructure plan. 
Um, they have a lot of details on their website. They're looking to report to their executive committee in January on principles, existing policies, emerging issues, and the initial consultation results. They wanted to make note of the times and uh, dates and locations of that work that they're doing, but they also wanted, and, and so we'll make sure this is uh, posted online tomorrow along with the rest of the presentation. Um, and they also wanted to, of course, um, remind that they will be doing a consultation on the Quayside proposals and um, whatever Waterfront Toronto's decision, uh, board decision is in March. And they're expecting to report to executive committee on Quayside um, back uh, uh, and the Waterfront Toronto board decision by summer of 2020. So what I'd like to do is walk you through how we imagined best using this time, because I know we've already got three folks that were looking to jump in, but I have a room of about 200, maybe 200 or more people, and I'm not going to be able to go to every single person right off the bat unless we're here for a week. So let me tell you how we thought through what we would do right now, and um, we uh, then can um, have it unfold. So uh, we would like to see if for 10 or 15 minutes, you can talk to the people sitting at your table and identify if there are two or three priority questions that you agree must be asked. Because that way we can quickly note where there is common ground in the room about what kinds of answers people, uh, questions people are looking for answers for. If you don't have a question and you'd like to have a comment, that's obviously fine too, but we really think that there will be a lot of questions as we're already flagged um, from you. So what we would, what we've done um, is we'd like to spend half of the time answering questions that you agree to as a table, and, ha and we'll do that always as a full room, and half of the time with an open mic around the room. I know we won't get to everybody, but we'll try to get to as many people as we can. So let me tell you how we thought through the small table piece would work. In addition to anybody who is making notes of questions on the back of your agenda, which you might have been doing on the presentation, we also put a big piece of green paper on your table. And the point here is that you as a group make a list of the major questions that you like to see Waterfront Toronto answer. It might be a minor clarification, but very important. It might be a major fundamental issue, but the intention is that within a group of 10 or five at each of your tables, you will identify two or three of those. Then you will write them on a big post-it note, one question per each, and we will walk them over to this wall here and start grouping them. So you can see, we anticipate that there will be some questions. I'm just gonna finish the explanation. There will be some questions related to threshold issues. There may be questions related to data. There may be questions related to the evaluation process. There may be questions related to sidewalk labs. You may have other questions. Whatever questions you have, if we spend half of the time having a negotiation among you at the table about what are the two or three priorities, We'll put them all up on the wall, and then Waterfront Toronto will answer all of those. Once we get through all of those, you have, may have other questions. We'll have two or three or maybe four open mics moving around the room for this last um, hour of the meeting. So one hour organizing and trying to get some idea of where the bulk of the questions are coming from, and then a whole other hour with open mic, and then anything we don't answer here, anything you write down, we will document as part of the meeting record, and Waterfront Toronto will respond. So that's the process we've... Well, I... This is exactly... Because, well, it's, it's a mechanical thing, to be honest, David. It's um, 200 people, maybe more in here. Everybody gets the mic, that's 200 questions. We've already taken up the meeting and you'd like some answers. So what this is an attempt to do very deliberately is to try and find where there are priority questions from people. And then we'll move the mics around the room. But we're all gonna stay in the same room all night because that was a strong piece of process advice that we got when we were out in July. So I'd like to hand it over to you. If it doesn't take more than 15 minutes and you don't wanna write down any questions, no problem. We'll move straight to a full room discussion but I'll leave it to you. Totally, okay. totally. Any question you want. No, Laura, yes, sure. Any question you want. Write it down and we will work to answer. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So we just had, can you put the, yeah. We just had one more note that if it's a question of clarification, 
We'll do those first. Okay, so if it's a question of clarification on the presentation, we'll do those first. It was a good suggestion. The other thing you might want to point out at some point is the fact that gathering up these extra questions gives us a chance to be able to reply to those that we don't get to tonight. Um, uh, yeah, no, you've done. So you so the uh, no, you just did a great job. So you know, everybody's gonna have their biases coming in. We just need to clarify the question. I think what we're gonna do is again amplify the fact, and that's on that. Unfortunately, the slides weren't clear, so I've given up my reason to get aggravated. But if they think we're making a decision. No, we got all the input from experts, and we said no, we reemphasize that we have experts in each of these areas that are gonna share that information with us. He was over there. Um, I don't see him right now. The
Okay, we've got a lot of questions up there. There are a number related to data, privacy, and digital governance, and a number related to the evaluation process. In the next couple of minutes, if you have any additional ones you want to add, please walk them over. Then we're going to start working through.
Okay, if everybody could have a seat, including all the folks by the wall, if you're a Waterfront Toronto person that's gonna help answer these questions, maybe grab some of the chairs at the front. Okay, we will make sure that photos of this wall are um, in the summary from today. And also, if you move away from the wall, then the live stream camera can show those questions um, to the folks uh, that are watching, uh, watching us remotely. And you can also use the um, comment bar on YouTube if you're watching remotely to ask your own questions. And I think that the folks have already been bringing them up. So I think what we'll do here is Ian and I will take turns at sort of trying to get through as much as we can um, in the different topic areas, but I wanted to do some broad observations first. And I think we should start with a number of people asked questions related to what exactly is it that Waterfront Toronto will be evaluating. And so I think that's a very important piece to start with. What is the proposal? Is Waterfront Toronto co-creating the thing that you're going to be evaluating? Um, is it possible to say no? So there's a whole set of what are you evaluating, who's writing it, and can you say no? And I don't know, George, do you want to start off? And then while I'm thinking that through, Ian, you'll go to the next set. I think we also had a big set around digital privacy, um, data privacy, digital governance. We had a whole set around the evaluation and others. So we'll just wait until George answers, and then we'll move to the next one. OK, I'll go with the, uh, so the issue, first of all, somebody raised, you know, is there a deal already? There is no deal. Stephen Diamond made it very clear that the, we've gotten through the threshold uh, issues. That was the first deadline, October 31st. These issues now have to be evaluated. And what we're evaluating is not, we're not co-creating. We're actually evaluating what they put forward that's relevant to the 12 uh, acres. We have experts, and Eric tried to touch on that, and I'll just elaborate. We have expert consultants, world no, renowned for the areas to give advice to us, and we will give that advice through to our board and our IREC committee, but that will also be shared ultimately in our public consultation, because I do want to eliminate things. That's what we ended up doing in the threshold. You know what? We're not going to keep talking about these. These we need answers to, and we're not going to keep talking about everything else until we get answers to these things. So, you know, the co-creation, it will be, it'll be iterative in the sense that it's their product we're evaluating, but we're going to knock off things that we say either we or the city or others are not going to accept. So there's no sense continuing to evaluate that based on the evaluations that's presented to the board. But I don't know if anybody else wants to add to that. Just from a technical perspective, we're going to evaluate only those components of the MIDP that was provided to us that made it through the threshold issues. And then after that, we will come forward with an innovation plan to the public that looks different than the MIDP. It will not be the whole MIDP. It will be the things that we think um, uh, meet our objectives, which are part of our mandate, which is part of what the public has um, fed back to us over the years that they have said are important. So those are the things we're going to bring forward to you. So yes, the innovation plan will not be the MIDP. And so just that's one of the questions explicitly. Is there an updated MIDP? If not, will there be? And I know one of the questions on the far side of the room were confused about what exactly would be evaluated. So, so you talked about an innovation plan and a development so plan. Yeah, the innovation, sorry, the MIDP has been modified by the resolution to those key issues that, that Eric and Christina took you through, and it's detailed in the letter. That's what's being evaluated by Waterfront Toronto senior staff and our subject matter experts, and these are, these are folks that have very, very qualified in their fields. After that, we will come forward with the things that we think we should be going forward with that meet our objectives. That's the innovation plan. The MIDP will be set aside. Lovely plan on your shelf. And we will have an innovation plan that, we, that meets our objectives and we'll bring that forward to you. So we won't be co-creating that or evaluating that. We will be working with you on that. Maybe... 
we'll go to the next question on the digital plan and we'll, we'll come back. Pardon me? Sorry, okay, David. so maybe we can provide a little more clarity. David, um, can you uh, just tell me what, what your question is? confusing. It says you will advocate for and support an innovation plan. Then it says you will develop it. Then it says you will develop it with Sidewalk Labs co-jointly. It doesn't not, say co-jointly. It says, well, we it says will you will develop it with Sidewalk Labs. Then it says in the document you handed out today that you are going to draft it and then you're going to evaluate it. It seems to me that that's a whole multitude of different roles and potential conflicts of interest built into it. But you just said you're going to draft it, and I read in this doc document you're going, to, you're going to develop it with Sidewalk Labs. Okay. That's my question. Super clear. We're going to do our best to, they're going to do their best to answer it, and we're going to move to a data question after that. Okay. Over to you. So you're correct. The letter does say with Sidewalk Labs uh, develop the plan. And to what George was saying, the... Um, Resolution to the threshold issues was a discussion with Sidewalk Labs. So we're going to we're going to evaluate the MIDP that's remaining because not all of it is going to get evaluated now, and then out of that we're going to say to Sidewalk, here are the things we think are valuable in this. These are the things we'd like to continue for, um, to go forward with, and they're going to say to us, well, you know what, we can do this, we can still do this. Maybe we can't do this one anymore, or maybe this one isn't feasible because um, the city is saying, well, we won't don't think we'll be able to support that particular thing and we will hone a plan. There will be some back and forth from sidewalk, but they will be things, only be discussing the things that Waterfront Toronto feels and with the public input are worth pursuing. So when it says with sidewalk, at the end of the day, they will be the partner to implement that with a developer. So they have to be able to agree. It's, it's you know, it'll be mutually agreed at the end of the day, but we'll only be taking forward things that Waterfront Toronto through public consultation and our mandate, thinks meets our objectives. And so. I think this is a good clue that this is uh, a piece that needs to be super clear in the write-up from today, as well as in uh, the preparations for Waterfront Toronto's next round of public consultation. So Ian, give us the question on data privacy and digital governance. Okay, I've got two questions here, uh, probably uh, for Christina, um, that are both connected. One is, how will the intelligent community guidelines inform Waterfront Toronto's evaluation of the, of the, uh, the innovation plan? Um, and just connected to that is when are Waterfront Toronto's intelligent community guidelines scheduled to be completed? So the intelligent community guidelines are actually more related to any potential implementation and they would relate to any proponent that was pr proposing to do work in the waterfront. Um, what is currently in the evaluation of the proposal relates back to legislative and regulatory compliance and ethical use of data and ethical solutions. The guidelines will be going forward to a consultation process uh, initially with industry as part of a market sounding and then will be part of what we bring to you in January to get your feedback. The guidelines have largely emerged from what has been happening sort of globally in these issues, but also from what we've heard in the previous rounds of consultation that are actually the public's concerns that we want to make sure that we're able to afford a higher degree of protection in a smart city than what traditionally would be uh, just, you know, the baseline of legislative and regulatory requirements. And this is similar to what we've done in our minimum green building requirements for sustainability as well. Okay, so a couple on governance. Um, which um, speak to, uh, there was one question um, around uh, what is the new government task force and what will they do? So I'll take that one. So one of the things that uh, we want to be able to do, and this came out quite frankly back in the 1999 uh, task force report was we need to have certainty around what the requirements, regulatory requirements should be as we develop the waterfront. So that was a mandate way back in, in, in the beginning of uh, Waterfront Toronto. We want to actually uh, put together teams of the city members, uh, federal members, ourselves, anybody who has regulatory to say, okay, what are issues that have to be addressed? So we're not uh, gonna reduce any requirements, but we're gonna be very explicit about what those requirements are. So that sidewalk can then uh, fundamentally answer whether this is economically viable for them or not, and that they have some certainty around when they'll get direction on when, you know, whether there's interest by the city building uh, permits to allow them to do certain things or 
uh, on the environmental side by the province. So we want to have uh, quick groups that I've, I've brought this together previously in, in other portfolios that I've been in, and it actually gets all the people at the table as opposed to having individual conversations. So that'll be just bringing people in and then having those discussions as we talked about in the January um, consultation. Okay. So I've got a couple of questions about affordable housing. Uh, I'll just do them as a pack. Uh, there's a few questions around how do you define affordability and what does affordable housing look like for Waterfront Toronto? Um, and then a specific question, which is, uh, are the uh, illegal size of apartments at Keyside going ahead? Those are all great questions. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Samit Alawalia. I'm one of the housing leads on this file at Waterfront Toronto. So just to step back a little bit, the definition of housing or affordable housing is rooted with the city's official plan, and they peg it to CMHC that puts out a report every year using average market rents for the area. So in order to qualify for capital A, what we're calling affordable housing, it has to be at or below 100% AMR. And to give you a bit of a proxy, right now, one bedrooms are about 1270. Based on the sidewalk proposal, they put forward a package that shows that capital A affordable is pegged at a blended average of 80% of the average market rent. And to continue, their program, what's been proposed in the mid-up, is affordable housing with a carve-out for deep affordability, which is pegged at 40% of that 100% average, and also what they've called a donut hole, which captures mid-range housing. And again, we tie this back to the City of Toronto's definition, along with a component of shared equity, which is this idea that a hybrid of renting and owning, that you can buy a portion of a unit, pay a down payment based on that, and kind of scale up gradually. And in terms of this idea of these illegal sized units, based on the threshold issues that have been outlined in the letter, it shows that one of the pieces that's been landed on is this idea that unit sizes need to be in conformity with the City of Toronto's affordable housing sizing. So that's one of the pieces in addition to the term of affordability, which is working towards in perpetuity, and the idea of ownership being retained with the public or the nonprofit sector. So there's a number of things up here that in uh, speak to and questions around the extent to which the public would be involved or consulted in different Waterfront Toronto decisions. So I heard it just chimed in on the last one, would the public be involved in, the, in any way in a new government task force? But also here, how does public opinion enter into the evaluation criteria of the final innovation and development plans? Is a referendum possible? So I think speaking to the extent to which Waterfront Toronto is committed to working with the public would be a, a, a one of you to, to speak to that. Yeah, I, you know what, I think, first of all, there are requirements around, uh, if we were to change regulations, et cetera, there are public consultation requirements that are already in place. So that'll you know, be something we'll have to look at is, are we modifying, uh, are we changing? Uh, and you'll have an opportunity, as we define better what the expectations are on the regulatory side, in January, our hope is that we'll have more relevance as we look at what's the list of innovations that we're actually talking about, and therefore, what are the regulatory requirements that would be relevant to those innovations, and what is the feedback from the task force. And we can open that discussion up to the public. We're not looking to have any of that discussion uh, you know, just behind closed doors, but we need to have the discussion first, uh, relevant to the innovations that are being brought forward, and then have the discussion with the public. Well, you know what, right now, regulations get discussed uh, among government officials all the time before they actually have the consultation. We want to just make sure the consultation is fruitful, that it has actually specifics around the innovations going forward. Otherwise, I'm not sure what we're consulting on with the public until we get those definitions of what we're actually evaluating and reviewing. Very, very quick follow-up. actually be evaluated appropriately. So if you guys are doing the technical evaluation based on a reduced MIDP, which I just checked out in the Keyside page 24 to page whatever it was, it's basically a laundry list of cool things. And even your digital strategy advisory panel said that it was tech for tech's sake, it's abstract, it's difficult to read, it's not detailed enough, it's not rigorous. So you're creating the innovation plan using the reduced MIDP, yes, you were able to kind of uh, uh, you know, take out some bits to it, 
but the plan itself is not good. So why not ask Sidewalk Labs to produce a much, much better detailed, rigorous document that can be properly evaluated? So I'll just touch on that. I think Maggie might want to jump in, but you know that is happening. I mean, the appendix that we just did on digital is exactly that. No, it gets into the specifics, but I won't, I don't know, Christina, if you want to speak to it. After. All right, so I'm going to let Meg jump in on some of the, the development pieces after, but just with regards to the technology piece, and I agree, Anna, there's a long way to actually still go to actually know about which solutions, the architecture, what data exactly for which solutions, and that needs to still come. So we are still in that process of determining whether or not the vision of what is being done on a technology perspective is valid. There are still partners they need to identify. There are products they need to select or we would need to select that actually have to be vetted. So it may not even be Sidewalk that has to provide some of that information. It may be other companies that need to do that. And we still need to keep in mind that everything that happens beyond March 2020, or sorry, December 2020, has the full process that goes forward in terms of drawings and submissions as part of the development process. This is not a simple process of just the MIDP as the definitive document. And even behind the scenes, there are other documents you could be downloading off of the sidewalk site that provide further technical details. We recognize the shortcomings of what was submitted in the MIDP, and that's where we have asked for specific clarifying questions. Um, I didn't come up in the slide that I showed, but we've actually given Sidewalk a series of questions, as have our subject matter experts, that are critical to getting those clarifications that we need in order to be able to do the evaluation. I believe actually most of them are. We'll flag them, Anna. Yep. Okay, we're just gonna keep going here. We will flag them in the summary for yep. today. We'll make sure that there are automatic links to all of those additional documents. And if I understand well, exactly what Waterfront Toronto evaluates will be part of the January consultation, will it not? Correct, and we'll, I'll talk to the team when I get back, Anna, about maybe bundling up what is relevant still to the evaluation so it's easy for people to navigate through the bulk of information that's out there too. So just before you lose the mic there, who are the subjects subject matter experts and how were they selected and then we'll go to a question on data which might um, pick, go back to Christina there. So Eric, the question is who are the subject matter experts and how were they selected? Right, so the, that fuzzy slide that uh, you couldn't see actually lists all the subject matter experts, unfortunately. Uh, and I will take you through them. Uh, so on sustainability, we have uh, Arup Engineering and Consulting. On buildings, it's the Moriyama and Tishima Architects. Uh, public Realm, Perkins and Will Architects. Uh, mobility, we're looking at Arup again. Um, economic Development is Steer Davies uh, Gleave, it's an Economic Development Consultant. Uh, housing Affordability is NBLC, Enberry Lions Consulting. Uh, social Innovation, I'm not sure, Social Infrastructure, sorry, I'm not sure which one that is. And then Digital and Data, and governance, we have McCarthy's and Denton's. And they, I think you asked a question about how they were procured. How were they selected? Well, um, and uh, are you looking for conflicts of interest? Uh, yes, we're looking for conflicts of interest. And we, Ralph and Toronto uh, has a procurement process. We have a whole department dedicated to procurement and they were procured through an open process uh, well in advance of this process. It takes can take up to three months to procure a consultant, so uh, we have already done all that. Ian, there's a questions around data. Yep, so they're all, there are three that are very closely connected, so I'll just share all three of them. Um, the first is, uh, what kinds of data uh, will be collected or could be collected uh, at Keatside? Uh, how is it being used or would it be used? And the third is, can we opt out of data collection and still go to Keyside? Very good questions. Uh, a number of the details with regards to potential types of data that would be collected at Keyside are provided in the Digital Innovation Appendix as a bit of an overview. Again, understanding that the actual solutions that may be used have not yet been determined. There's only a small portion of solutions that Sidewalk is actually proposing that they themselves deliver in, um, in the Keyside development area. Consent is something that is, is important to us and making sure that there are alternatives in terms of being able to say no and still enjoy that neighborhood is absolutely vital. The data elements of this project should not be 
a determination of whether or not you want to come to the waterfront and experience the waterfront. So we're looking at the mechanisms of consent in the public realm and what that looks like um, and looking to make sure that there are those opportunities to, in fact, opt out. And there was a third question. I'm not sure if I touched on it. No, I think you got the, the middle one was how is it being used? Okay. And that's all in the DIA per, uh, per pillar. Okay. No, it's just because we expanded. <laughs> Considering what we know about what just a second, I'll give you the mic. Non-consensually with data, including the mass upload of de-anonymized uh, personal information from healthcare, and their bizarrely authoritarian, totalitarian plan they even had for sidewalk as of 2016. Why isn't that enough to just stop this project? already like we know that they don't care about federal regulation we know that they don't care about whether you opt in or opt out so why do we think as you know a country or a province or a city or a neighborhood that we have any power to limit the kind of information being collected on anybody who walks in there unless say i like leave my cell phone at home and make sure to not you know walk past any particular infrastructure while I'm there and maybe crawl low to the ground. I don't know, like. So George, I'm not sure, did you want to take this one and I can add to it? Yeah, I, I, you know, this discussion has occurred on many occasions. We're, we're putting in, you no, know, it's been raised and, and we're trying to address this up front. You know what, we're trying to deal with the issues by identifying what is it we're trying to ensure would uh, restrict their ability to, to do those things. And we're putting in mitigation measures to also say, what are the penalties? And make sure those penalties are significant enough that it makes a difference. I, I'm just saying what we're trying to do. And no, you know, nobody's outlawed uh, Google from their country. We need to be realistic about what we can do in this project. And we're trying, and we're trying, to, uh, and we're trying to address the issues uh, through the vehicles that we have available to us. I don't know. If you want so to. we've known from the beginning that this is a major issue, and Waterfront Toronto certainly read the results of our report on the public feedback in July. Trust in Sidewalk Labs and Google and Alphabet has been something consistently raised. I don't know if Christina, you. Yeah, and I'll and just add to that, actually, Nicole. It's a really good point in the fact that we've heard this time and again. Um, and we've talked a bit about the fact that Sidewalk isn't necessarily Google. They are an alphabet company, so I'm not going to hide behind that. Not, I, I just said I'm not hiding behind that. The reality is, though, that we are actually able to take from those opportunities or, or from those um, situations that have arisen, and they're actually forming some of the approaches that we're taking with sidewalk in terms of mitigations, remedies, as George said. And there is a very significant layer on top of this that relates to the three levels of government and the policies that they are putting in place to deal with big tech. This isn't just a waterfront Toronto quayside issue that needs to be addressed. So there's other uh, opportunities for consultation and input that I would encourage you to make sure that your voices are being heard at as well. Because absolutely, we're hearing you now. We've been hearing you all the way through this process, and that has been a part of how we've been conducting ourselves in those discussions. So I'm going to, there's a little bit of a change in, I, we, I have a, I'm sorry, sir. Okay, is Waterfront Toronto turning governance over to Google? The concern is that they're, all, so, do we know if they're a constitutional monopoly or not? No, and so we have bit. So I'm we're going to get to the I'm answer and then some question. more questions. Yeah, so. Sir, would you, like the, would you like George to answer? No, no answer. Okay, next question. Okay, perfect. George, it's you. Yeah, so, you know, we, we were very clear, the board was very clear, the governance stays with us. All of the uh, decision-making powers, the controls on data, et cetera, will always uh, stay with us. So that's how we're trying to address some of the issues that we heard in the consultations, but I'll just leave it at that. So I've got two others that I just have a different flavor. Excuse me, sir. We're not going to have a, a, a talking over each other competition. I've got a wall full of questions that came from 200 people in here. I'd like to work through them. 
I'd like to go through so that the other people in the room also have a chance to have their questions answered. What is the potential, so this is the flip side, just like we heard in July. What is the potential risk of taking too much time to start development? Sidewalk Lab seems ready, but our time to come to consensus may risk um, losing our partner or including after project approval, which is an assertion that's not necessarily the case, what will prevent governments from changing the project and delaying completion? So there are people in this room who are asking about what is the, what is the potential risk of taking too much time with respect to Sidewalk Lab's interest, and what's the potential risk on the governance side if there is a change in government and it delays the project completion. So those are another angle on this. Um, well, firstly, I wanna say the process has to include the public interest. So we're gonna take the time, I've said this before at every consultation, we'll take the time it needs to get through this process. And I think Sidewalk has learned over the course of the last 18 months that these things take time. Um, our process is uh, more uh, collaborative collaborative in this country and in this city. Um, we do a lot more consultation here than I think they're maybe used to in other jurisdictions, and it will take the time it takes. Um, I think they are uh, ready to be, be patient. They, um, you know, were ready to take on the resolution of the threshold issues and focus just on Keyside, um, a much smaller uh, vision than they had. So I think they're ready to um, embrace how we do things here and how the process works here in Toronto and um, include real deep public engagement. And I think that they will, um, they'll stay at the table as long as they think people are um, willing to um, listen and share their thoughts and ideas on the project. Got uh, questions about transportation. Um, uh, they're again both connected. Uh, how would new innovation in transportation increase safety for the most uh, vulnerable road users? And the second question is, are autonomous vehicles included in the transport transportation innovations and how will they be regulated? Pina's coming up. Um, okay, so on the autonomous vehicles, there is not a heck of a lot in the MIDP around autonomous vehicles specifically. I think what the MIDP really focused on was uh, designing a road network that could accommodate autonomous vehicles if they ever happen. So designing a network that's flexible enough so that you don't have to rip up the whole road to take advantage of the fact, for example, that autonomous vehicles use a little less space than um, cars driven by people like me. Uh, what was the other question? Um, uh, would, uh, how, would, uh, how would new innovations in transport uh, increase safety for vulnerable road users? Well, I'll speak to one innovation specifically. Um, they're uh, introducing something called adaptive signals, which I think has been written about uh, since the DIA was released. Adaptive signals from their perspective are signals that would uh, be designed to accommodate some of the vulnerable users. So someone that maybe can't make it across the street in what would be a standard uh, phase for a red signal, it would uh, detect that that was happening and uh, increase the length of that signal. That's one example, for example. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I have um, a couple related to development and then we'll come back to a few related to money. Um, so how does Waterfront Toronto ensure that developers will adopt innovations from sidewalk labs? And how will the competitive process determine the vertical development partners? Is there a vision? Is there a price? So I'll do the first one. How does Waterfront Toronto ensure the developers will adopt the innovation plan from sidewalk labs? So the innovation plan, first of all, isn't going to be from Sidewalk Labs. As I mentioned before, we, we will bring it forward and Sidewalk will have to agree to it if they want to continue on. And so with all of our development, um, development partners, we have what's called a development agreement. And in that development agreement, we have certain specifications that they have to meet, lead gold being the example everybody knows, we'll have maybe Passive House will be the new generation of that. So we will enforce that through contract with Waterfront Toronto. So um, Sidewalk and the development partner that we competitively select um, will have to enter into an agreement with Waterfront Toronto to meet all of the requirements that we set. What was the second question? Sorry, Nicole. Um, 
How will the competitive process determine the vertical development partners? Is it based on vision? Is it based on price? So at the, um, as, we, as we come forward to you with the innovation plan and the development plan, and we, if, if successful and if people are on side, we will create something that has some specifications around it, like passive house, like tall timber. Um, and then we will develop an RFP, a request for proposals, that we will issue broadly to the market. It will be an international call. Um, this is only 12 acres. It may not attract international attention. It may be um, likely more local developers who will, and we've heard interest from lots of them who are, are very interested in developing um, on the waterfront on Keyside. And we will go through um, a typical RFP process where we um, set up some qualifications, we shortlist usually, and then we assess um, their proposals based on um, a variety of different criteria, financial um, stability, et cetera. And then um, we will have uh, a, a selection process through, we'll have a steering committee, we will have a fairness advisor, we had Justice Coulter Osborne on this process. So we'll have all of that rigor in the process and that's how we'll be able to select a partner. And I, m I meant to ask the third, it's very connected, what is the proposed timeline for selecting additional developers to implement the Keyside Development Plan? So proposed timeline. So we're working through that right now. Um, we're trying to determine a process. We need to check in with the city because there is a city piece of land within the Keyside project. So um, I think sooner than later, because I think that'll bring a lot of clarity and comfort to the process, um, it does take time to develop the document and, um, and get it out to the public. So you won't see it before March, but it might be shortly thereafter. After, we just have to speak with the city about some stuff first. Okay, uh, question I've got here is why is innovation such a high priority? Well, if you go back to the mandate, that was one of the key factors in the mandate of Waterfront. So that's the key. We're trying to, we were innovators when we were actually bringing in the leads requirements for environmental requirements, which got picked up by uh, the city and other jurisdictions. That, that's really what we do, and um, that's why we're focused on the innovations part of this. It's just not a real estate transaction. Okay. Sure, JJ, go. Loud enough so I can repeat it. Okay. Yulia's coming with the mic. Sure, um, so a basic question. My, my understanding is that Waterfront Toronto is a, um, its mandate is to revitalize the waterfront um, from the center to the east in a, in a staged way, and then when that's finished, it's done. Um, and that process takes maybe 20, 25 years, but data governance is um, a permanent role. How do those jive? So I'm gonna let Christina speak to this, but this goes back to the control issue, and a lot of that controls with government, right? So. Actually, I was just gonna say that same thing, uh, and this is why it was so important to nest the entire proposal back to the existing and future uh, laws and regulations that would be in place. And when we hand over projects, to one of our government partners, the development agreement, which would actually have things like the uh, intelligent community guidelines or minimum green building requirements and things like that specified within them, get handed over to our government partners who would therefore have the authority moving forward to enforce those. Okay, I've got a few questions related to money. Um, and uh, so let's, the first one, who's paying for land remediation? Um, that is uh, a sidewalk labs requirement. Okay, next, next one. Sorry, so sidewalk, sidewalk labs. labs will pay for remedi soil remediation. What um, if is, they move forward? What is the total public financial contribution, which I think came out through the presentation, going to be to developing Keyside? For example, tax abatements, incentives, contributions for affordable housing, public infrastructure. What is the total public financial contribution um, going to be? That's going to be required. So I think um, Eric mentioned the investments. That's the sort of thing that we were talking about, and that hasn't been determined yet. We have to see whether or not the, um, for example, the affordable housing plan, are there improvements we can make to that plan? We want more than the 20%. We want deeper affordability. Um, we want in perpetuity, for example. And um, there are certain government funding programs that typically pay for the bricks and mortar. Waterfront Toronto sets aside the land. Um, will there be additional monies that are required to get even deeper affordability? Would Waterfront Toronto consider um, investing in some of that? So all of that is um, part of the work that we have to do over the next few months to figure out what that contribution will be. So don't know yet, but it's coming. What is the timeline on revenue sharing that Waterfront Toronto is asking for? 
and will it go through a separate government approval process? So revenue sharing um, has been raised from the beginning. What's the timeline? And will it go through a separate government approval process? So the, um, the in intellectual property revenue sharing component, as I mentioned in the threshold issues piece, we moved it from profit-based to net revenue-based. And the duration, the percentage, of that is something that is still to be determined um, through this process moving forward. In, in terms of the revenue sharing, there would be a requirement for us to be able to get consent from governments to actually collect that revenue, so there would be engagement with our government shareholders on that piece. Okay, and I think this comes to you too, if, or maybe not, you guys decide, if 50% of funds will come from Canadian venture capitalists, what will be the expected rate of return on any investment they make on the project? If I don't deep percent of I don't have the detail in terms of the venture capital portfolio at my fingertips right now and that is something that we would have to talk to sidewalk to get that information about okay Ian what have you got has the planned development agreement between Sidewalk Labs and Waterfront Toronto been amended? Um, and are the threshold issues and the, the resolution of those uh, legally binding? That's a good question. Um, the PDA, we, I think, mentioned in the letter that the plan development agreement will be amended to um, deal with a couple of sections around exclusivity, um, and that would only pertain then to the 12 acres instead of, I think it's the designated waterfront area. Um, I am not a lawyer, so I am going to maybe reserve on whether or not they're legally binding. I would say they're not legally binding, the resolution um, of the threshold issues, but Waterfront Toronto's board has approved, and therefore we won't proceed on any other basis. George, do you want to? Yeah, uh, you're not going to have anything that's legally binding until you actually have an agreement. We have no agreement yet. We have an alignment on the threshold issues, so once we have an agreement, we'll have legal um, supports for that. So I've got a couple questions about project boundaries. How is the performance of um, Keyside, and they're, they're both related to how Waterfront Toronto evaluates going forward. How is the performance of Keyside being measured for success? What are the key performance indicators and who determines these? I think this was flagged in the presentation. And it's connected to if the project falters, presumably if they didn't meet those performers, performance indicators for Keyside, what are the provisions for terminating the agreements and delivering an acceptable waterfront for the city? So they're both related to, and we know this came up in July, how do you get out? Yeah. And under, when would you? Right. Um, so all of those have to be determined through if, if the board decides to move forward with a plan in March we would go into detailed negotiations of these implementation agreements. That would be part of that. So those performance measures and exit ramps, we have them in all of our development agreements. Um, we have opportunities to repurchase land if we've transferred and the developer's not um, performing. We have, in some cases, we don't transfer the land at all until they've performed certain things. Um, we have always got um, opportunities to get out of the deal and all of those will be determined through the negotiation of the implementation agreements if we get past March. So I'm gonna suggest we take until quarter after eight and then I'll start over here and then I'll come here. Oh, sorry. If the sidewalk wants to expand beyond the 12 acres, right, you're right. they're supposed to meet oh, some right. performance criteria. Well, what are those criteria and who will evaluate? So just for folks at the back, the first part of the question is what are the criteria to determine if Keyside, if Sidewalk does uh, Keyside successfully and how would you determine if they had met those criteria, those performance measures, right? Sorry, Jean, you say it and uh, because I, I agree, we didn't get the answer. Yeah, my question is that in the Halloween agreement, it says that uh, Sidewalk Labs can expand beyond the initial phase. Just like it says in the request for proposals that it can expand beyond the initial phase. So it can expand ac according to certain criteria that it meets. And supposedly those criteria have to do with meeting Waterfront Toronto's, um, uh, what are they called? The opportunity uh, things. Objective savings. <laughs> the uh, opportunity objectives, whatever. They, so how, how are those um, criteria going to be measured and who's going to measure them um, in, in order to de decide whether Sidewalks Labs can expand beyond those 12 acres? So a couple of things. Uh, sorry, I misunderstood your question originally. Um, so 
if sidewalk, we, Waterfront Toronto would determine whether or not sidewalk met all of the requirements of um, any um, agreement we might have with them. So as I said, we will set up those performance measures through um, negotiating those implementation agreements. And if they don't meet those, we can terminate. If they meet all of those things, oh, Waterfront Toronto, if sidewalk were to, to, if we deemed at the end of the project, we feel like you've been successful, it would not be up to us That's at that point for them to expand. So, because we don't have, we don't own any more land other than Keyside. So it would be in conjunction with the city or any other landowner in the waterfront, Ports Toronto owns some land, whether or not they were allowed to proceed, and the city made it very clear in their letter any um, entertainment of any kind of expansion would be through a completely open and competitive process. So Waterfront Toronto doesn't have the right to allow Sidewalk to expand, but we do have the right to measure the success of the project and say whether or not we think it met um, those um, you know, elements that we um, set out in the uh, implementation agreements. So I'm It's not our property. Be, uh, beyond Keyside, this is, and this is why it was very clear in the letter back from the city that that's their property. They'd have to go through an open procurement process. So the city would establish whatever criteria they want to entertain with regards to any procurement for additional lands beyond Keyside. So it is not within our realm, and we would work with the city to share any information that they would want uh, with regards to the per performance should we move forward with sidewalk on this project. And just to flag, we've, I'm, I'm going to open, I'm going to suggest that we didn't make it through the entire wall, um, but a lot of people uh, have additional questions. We're going to ask three or four more from the wall, and then we're going to have an open mic for the final 45 minutes moving around the entire room. I know we had a hand here, we have a hand at the back. I just wanted to flag, based on that question, that in that October 29th letter from George to Sidewalk Labs, Schedule B attaches a letter from the city, so by your deputy city manager and the CEO of CreateTO back on the topic, so you might, just flagging that it's, that it's in there if you wanna see where the, the city's position is. Um, okay, a couple from Ian, we'll do one more here, and then we'll have mics moving around the room. So the question is, uh, what is Sidewalk Lab's business plan and can the public uh, technically evaluate it? Okay, um, I'm gonna, um, Sidewalk Labs has articulated, so this is not, these are not my words. Sidewalk Labs has articulated in public um, and to us that they have three areas of business. One is real estate. Um, one is infrastructure, so advanced infrastructure, not sewer and water. It's um, things like um, vacuum waste, perhaps, or um, thermal grids, those sorts of things. And the third one is on um, intellectual property. So applications they might um, create, or I think there's something in the MIDP called a koala, um, which is a mount, like a USB port, and they would perhaps, if it's successful here, they would... Um, spread that all over the world, world and make money on it. And as Christina said, we would, um, we as the public agency would collect some of that share. Um, those are the three ways they've articulated publicly and to us on how they would make money. I don't know how, I don't know, side, Sidewalk's a private company, so I don't know how um, you would technically evaluate those business models for them, their, their business models. So I'm not really sure I have an answer to that one. I don't. I'm looking around. But it, it integrates into the public sphere, their business models. <laughs> so we're talking about sidewalk. I'm that I'm just telling you what sidewalk has said their business model is. Um, and um, I don't know I don't know how the public evaluates a private company's business model. So that might Meg, be something where Meg, we do a follow Can you just uh, comment what do we do right now with our existing developers? We, when we get into agreements, we check their backgrounds, we do... Sure, we, yeah. yeah, we look into um, uh, any, we ask if, uh, in fact, we do it before we do any, um, even select a partner. We ask our proponents, for example, to say if they have any current litigation going on, because we, you know, we don't want to be doing that. Um, it's a little different with our current developers, because they have really one business model, which is the real estate, which is um, the transaction they're doing with us. Sidewalk Labs model is more complicated, and um, you know, I, I can't, 
say how you would technically um, evaluate how, you know, how they make money and if that's good enough for them. I've got three questions um, that relate to uh, social related social issues. So um, I'm going to read all three, and then maybe there's a package that can come together here. So where is the social plan? How people? How are the people integrated? Which is related to also how will Waterfront Toronto address the need for outside space, care, collective health, employment, community benefits? How will Waterfront Toronto essentially ensure a complete community? Um, and then uh, in terms of evaluation criteria, people were flagging, okay, there's job creation, housing affordability, and climate neutral, but by whose standards? For example, does this mean decent paying jobs, affordability for people on a low income, neutral carbon footprint? So I think you can either address them separately or together, but it's certainly in the theme of how do you make sure that this is a complete um, community and where is the social plan? How do we see people in here and who gets to evaluate that? and set the standards for that. Um, so we, um, okay, that's a, a lot. Okay, well, I'll ask you the first there. one. Where is the, so, <laughs> where is the social plan? That's the first one. Well, so, well, that and other ones that have been asked there, that's why we're gonna look at the MIDP um, innovation chapter, volume two, and see what ones we think, you know, address our objectives, and our objectives are always about complete communities, schools, daycares, jobs, employment, affordable housing. And listen, I know people in this room will say, well, it's not affordable enough, and I agree with you completely. Um, we work with our government partners to get as much affordability as we possibly can. Um, Waterfront Toronto sets aside land for 20%, but we also build all the infrastructure. We build the roads, we build the parks. So the money we get for the land has to be spread over a whole bunch of priorities, one of which is for example, affordable housing. So we try and do as much as we can with that, but but the whole purpose of why we're here is to create complete communities. And I think if you look at the ones that we've done so far, and I think some of the reasons why some of you are here tonight is because you like some of the work that we've done in the past. Nicole, can you help me with the rest? Yeah, the next one, um, so how will Waterfront Toronto, and I think this covers it, address the need for outside space, care, collective, health, employment, community benefits? How does Waterfront Toronto create, ensure a, create a complete community? You said that's part of your criteria well, yes, to ensure it is. That's right. So then it gets to the details, and we've seen um, Good Jobs for All and other um, organization or groups come forward and make the point whose standards, so what, who sets what affordable is, who sets what a decent paying job is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how affordable would it be for people on low income, where does Waterfront Toronto take their guidance from in terms of what informs those evaluation criteria? Right. So on the affordability piece, again, we work with our government partners. We work um, through the official plan, which Samit mentioned, so we make sure that we meet that. We do try with um, our government partners to get funding that helps us reach deeper affordability. Um, uh, shoot, what, was, what am I missing? Oh, we were, oh yeah, we work with nonprofits. We bring in other partners to help us achieve some of those things. And um, on things like public space and daycares and community centers, we work with the city. We work with our um, our nonprofit partners, such as Artscape, to try and achieve all of those things. We try and get as many of those elements in a community as we can. Um, and we work with our government partners to make sure that we're um, achieving the, their objectives as well. One more thing here, with the realignment of the project, it's just a bit of a change in uh, uh, drift, but with the realignment of the project scope to the 12 acres of Quayside, what strategies will Waterfront Toronto take to create a cohesive vision across the 190 acres to achieve the scale that some of the innovations call for? So with the realignment down to the 12 acres, what strategies will Waterfront Toronto take to create a cohesive vision across the 190 to achieve the scale that some of the innovations call for? Well, so first of all, some of the innovations that are in the MIDP may fall away because there is no promise of scale. So there may be some things that aren't, um, aren't possible anymore, and we have to assess that through our evaluation. Um, and then Waterfront Toronto works with the city in partnership. We have a memorandum of understanding. We have worked with them through the Portland's um, uh, for planning framework, the, um, all the environmental assessment work in the Portlands, et cetera. So we would work with the city um, to talk about any ambitions that are we're finding success on Quayside that the city might be interested in implementing in any other lands um, in the eastern waterfront, and we would try and move those forward. But we would do that with the city to plan over. The 190 acres is no longer a 
thing because um, we've moved down to the 12 acres. So going forward, it would be things that we found successful on Keyside and that the city would want to partner with us on. Quickly, Ian, yeah. How will the data and technologies uh, benefit Canadian tech companies? That's a really good question, and uh, some of the work that we've done through the threshold issues piece around the intellectual property components, particularly around the patent pledge, will be helping to unlock some of the sidewalk patents, for instance, for Canadian companies to be able to develop upon. One of the things that we really need to work through in this next phase as we think about approaches to data sharing and responsible data sharing is what element of data is actually appropriately proprietary, not just from Sidewalk, but from other providers, what data can be shared with appropriate protections, and what data truly can be opened without providing any sorts of vulnerabilities. Those data sets each have an opportunity that they could actually help to benefit Canadian companies. And I think it's important to keep in mind that actually the whole key side RFP process was designed in a way that was intended to help unlock opportunity for Canadian companies. That was the heart and soul of the economic development and prosperity element of the RFP, and that's something we're still firmly committed to. I think also uh, through what we've seen surface through the DIA, with the, um, the list of innovations that was very helpful to begin to understand the opportunities that exist for other companies to engage. I believe there was 200 and some odd different solutions that they noted in the DIA, and of that, Sidewalk was actually only proposing to deliver 10 of those. So there's a large amount of opportunity for other companies, and in particular, we're hoping Canadian companies to engage. Okay, last one, and then we're going to open up to the room. We have three roving mics that are going to move across. But just before we get there, um, what is Waterfront Toronto's Plan B or Plan C if we don't enter into agreement with Sidewalk Labs? Um, so if we don't enter into agreement with Sidewalk, we have learned a lot of things we like, things maybe we don't like. Uh, we've learned a lot about what the community likes and doesn't like. So our plan would be to... Um, take that learning, talk to, we would engage the public no matter what, we would talk to industry, and we would decide what do we want to continue on with on Keyside. And we would do an, a new RFP. Um, the RFP we did with Sidewalk and the other proponents is no longer, so we would start again with a new RFP and engage a new partner. Um, we've done a lot of thinking, a lot of research. We've benefited tremendously from the work that Sidewalk has done things that are good and not good, um, we can use those things to then see what does the marketplace think is interesting, what does the community think is interesting, what, what do we want to do on Keysight going forward. So we would start a new process. Good. So Matthew, Yulia, and Cly are walking around with microphones. They're going to queue people up one, two, three. If you've already asked a question in the meeting, you will not get the mic first. We're going to go to people who haven't had a chance, and then we will make sure we get to others as well. So. Uh, let's start. Matthew, you got somebody? And I always say the quicker the, I don't encourage you to over, to, to go too fast, and I don't need you guys to go too fast either, but the brisker we keep the question and the answer, the more we'll get to. So let's go here, and then I'll come here. Okay, so one of the uh, answers I was just given was about the fact that we're focusing on Canadian companies and Canadian innovation in this and the opportunities for that. Um, but also Canada, and we are relying on Canada's data standards and all three levels of government are creating new and improved Canada or data standards for Canada. Other places of the world will not have those standards and um, Sidewalk Labs is going to export any of the IP they create to other countries without such strong data protections. Is there anything, I don't know if you can, is there anything we can do to kind of make sure that we're not a test bed for IP and technologies that are going to harm the rest of the world? So that's a really good question, and it came up actually at the Digital Strategy Advisory Panel meeting when the Sidewalk actually first presented. And one of the things that we talked about is inserting language around ethical use of technology into the licensing agreements that we would need to see before they would actually be available as export products into other markets, which may actually these state actors, for instance, may not be good actors. So you don't want to particularly, like for example, Koala, have that be a mount that would then be used by a dictatorship to surveil its pedestrians on a more or more regular basis. So we are thinking about that. And we also, of course, the data protections and not moving data from location to location when those protections aren't in place. For Canada, is already a provision that Canadians are protected against, and we would make sure that that's reinforced. Okay, great. Yulia, question. Um, one sec. Sorry. I'd like to hold the mic. That, thank you. Um, so my question is about, uh, on your expert list um, for 
uh, data governance. You have listed McCarthy, you mentioned this as well, McCarthy Tetro and Dentons. As far as I understand, their client roster is, I think it would be fair to say, industry side law firms. I'm wondering if you're going to include any public interest law firms as subject matter experts on the issue of data and governance. So, okay, there's a couple of, of interesting points to this one. So McCarthy's and uh, Denton's. So Denton's is actually Chantal Bernier, who's the former Federal Interim Privacy Commissioner, as well, we've got uh, George Cash on the McCarthy side of it. We also have Tim Banks from a smaller boutique law firm that's been working on the intellectual property issues, as well as Ann Kavukian has been advising us on this project. Um, we've also had the Digital Strategy Advisory Panel put in place, as you know, which has 15 sort of leading experts across the fields that are bringing that forward. From a digital rights and sort of a digital literacy piece, there's uh, our digital uh, rights piece that we've also just recently put out an RFP for a human rights impact assessment that we'll look at a number of those issues as well. So again, there are a variety of voices that are being brought through DSAP. And through these consultations, you know, we had a number of luminaries that actually attended the last round of consultation that brought their voices and their perspectives forward as well. And we're going to continue to add those voices to the mix, Sibel. So on that note, if you have a suggestion and a piece of advice, because buried in that question, I think, is a very clear piece of advice, which are there other voices that you think that you would like to see Waterfront Toronto consider in terms of this area of expertise? I think we also take it as a piece of advice. So it's not just a question and an answer. I think it's also clearly a piece of advice. Um. Uh, all those other folks you mentioned, I don't think they're part of the technical evaluation. They come after the fact. We're talking about the initial evaluation, and from what I understand, they're not part of that. And so, you would like to see them to be part of it. Christina, you want to add? And then I've got two people here. I just want to actually note that the DSAP actually did their preliminary commentary, their preliminary evaluation, which forms part of what's feeding into the technical evaluation. So those voices that I've listed off actually have been part of what would be part of the, the technical evaluation thus far. Okay, next question. Uh, you mentioned the digital trust was ditched because Sidewalk would have too much power. Uh, there's nothing inherently like you could have set it up without giving them that much. So was that them saying they didn't want it or because it, it does seem like it could deal with a lot of these issues. So can you just expand on why you decided not to go that route? So the Urban Data Trust, there was a number of issues with regard to how they were proposing it. So this, the trust as it was proposed in their plan was removed from the table. There are some really good ideas that are in there, but they're not necessarily sidewalks to figure out. They may not actually be Waterfront Toronto's to figure out. This may be something that governments, the broader public sector, academia, all have a place at the table to figure out, particularly around the responsible data use and responsible data sharing. Where it was highly problematic was around the governance layer and how the data trust would be able to enforce even on governments which was the original proposal that was received from Sidewalk. So taking that back doesn't mean that everything that was encompassed in a data trust may not come to surface, and there's a lot of work happening beyond the Keyside project in that area, and it would be something that we'd be interested to see other models that could come forward similar to a trust, but not that particular model of a trust. Okay, very, actually very quickly, and then I'm gonna go to Clyde. Um, thank you. When will Waterfront Toronto file documents um, for, to respond to the CCLA lawsuit? Might provide a little background so folks know what this is all about. Okay, you know what? Uh, th we're kind of limited on this one because this is before the court, so I don't want to get into um, any details, but we are responding to that, so I'll just leave it at that. Next question over here. If you've already had a chance to ask a question, just so you don't keep your hand up, I'm going to people who haven't had a chance as yet, so go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have to say I'm really quite shocked that at this stage in the process, so many questions are unanswerable that should have been answered at the stage, at the time the RFP was evaluated. Um, but given the dog and pony show that Sidewalk has put on over the last couple of years, um, and now their world domination plans have been reduced to 12 acres, I'm wondering what is the answer to the question that people have asked since day one. What in the long term does Sidewalk want? What will it get out of building a few wooden buildings on 12 acres of Toronto? What is the long term plan? There must be more. Has it to do with somehow they're going to be financing part of their 
uh, infrastructure and they will get some kind of ability <clears throat> to blackmail the city, who knows? But there must be a longer term ambition for sidewalk in this, and I don't think we should consent to going ahead with them because the alphabet group of families are a pretty shady bunch. We shouldn't agree to go ahead with any part of our city's development with these people unless we know in much more detail and much more clearly and in some form that we can trust what are their long-term plans and expectations. Okay. I think that came as a piece of advice, um, and we're going to go to the next question, and I've got you in my queue. I'm sorry, sir. I'm just going to go to the folks who haven't had a chance. So I have a million questions, but I'll ask one basic one, um, <laughs> which is, I understand, I know that Waterfront Toronto is funded by three levels of government, which means funded by all of us and lots of other people. So I'm wondering, particularly in light of what seems to me to be a very questionable decision to uh, give this, uh, award the RFP to an a international monolith, um, to whom is Waterfront account uh, Toronto actually accountable? And how do citizens who are paying the bill access that uh, accountability chain? Great question. Well, first of all, you know, we as staff are accountable to the board. The board has representatives that uh, the governments have selected. The governments uh, have commented on this, and, and you know, the province, uh, municipality of Toronto, and the feds have identified, as, as you know, the premier did, um, there are certain things that he wants to ensure that we get fair market value on the land, that the public interest with regards to privacy is addressed, et cetera. So when we went through those threshold issues, uh, those issues were the same issues that we identified, that Steve Diamond identified in the open letter. Um, we walked governments through, as our partners, what we thought was a reasonable proposal uh, supported by the board. And you know, as you read the response from our government partners, they feel that at least the first threshold issues have been addressed and that you know, it's okay to go to the next level, and that's where we're at. Okay, here, next question. Uh, thank you. Um, this may be a, a simple question, but um, who is going to be responsible for maintaining over the long term these so-called innovations um, and that we're not going to get stuck with a bunch of junk that doesn't work? <laughs> yeah, so I'll touch on that, but uh, I'll turn it over to the staff. So. That's one of the big issues that we've been uh, discussing, not just with Sidewalk, but we want to make sure that we have a backstop with an entity that has the resources that we can draw on should they fail. Uh, and we're making it very clear in the agreement, they're responsible and we can draw on appropriate resources to ensure that we're not left with a liability on the innovation. So that's where we're at, but I don't know if anybody wants to add to that. Well, we would work with um, in all of our agreements with our developers, we require um, securities, um, and in some cases, we require the securities to be located here in Canada in certain accounts, et cetera, so that if something else fails, the money's already set in a reserve fund or something like that. So we would have to make sure that we have the resources. So not just that Waterfront Toronto wouldn't be left holding the bag, but neither would the municipality or any other level of government. In the public realm. And that's what I'm, I am talking about, that any, any element that Sidewalk might have in the public realm. But if you look at the letter, we're, Waterfront Toronto will be responsible for designing and implementing the public realm. But let's say, for example, they partnered with someone like N-Wave and we're doing um, district energy or thermal um, loop system. Um, we would have backstops that if that failed, and the city would have that as well, right? N-Wave already functions in the right of way, in the public realm, um, and the city must have uh, municipal access agreements with them, et cetera. So we and the city would take all the precautions required to ensure that nobody um, in the public sector is being left holding the bag, and we can do that through reserve funds, letters of credit, um, and, and uh, parental guarantees and things like that. Yulia, at the back. The, the Logic is a Toronto-based tech publication, and in their anonymous survey, 
of the technologists who read their publication, 57% of technologists, well, their readers, their subscribers, disagreed with the statement that Waterfront Toronto should approve the Sidewalk Labs plan. And given the lack of dissent in Toronto's tech community, does it frighten you that there isn't public dissent, but there seems to be a lot of anonymous private dissent? So I think that uh, what is actually very interesting now is that the opportunities that were not particularly evident in the MIDP have now surfaced. So what we're going to be looking at is through this process as we go through, we're going to have good conversations around the intelligent community guidelines and we're hopefully going to be talking to a lot of those people to understand what the sentiment is now that it's understood that it's not going to be a pure play sidewalk labs delivering every solution. Um, it seemed quite monolithic in the MIDP. It was unclear how much of those opportunities would be open to the market. So that is something that I'm very curious because of the goal of the RFP to actually understand a lot more of. And we do have conversations with local incubators and accelerators and things like that. But the local tech ecosystem has to be a part of whatever would move forward. And therefore, we do need to make sure that they're supportive. Okay, next question. Um, you guys talked quite a bit about um, affordability and the importance of having affordability in um, communities, right? Um, I just wanted to know, how exactly are you and Sidewalk Labs gonna work together to guarantee not only affordability, but deep affordability? And how are you gonna sustain that over a period of time? I mean, like, co-living and um, shared equity are really good, but like, if the quotas and goals um, need to be met, I think maybe, um, I don't know if you guys think this, but maybe something more drastic must be done. Um, to get housing to those who need it. What do you guys think that is? Or do you have any idea of what that is? Good job. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. That's, uh, that's fantastic to see everyone engaged in this. With affordable housing, and Meg said this uh, earlier on, you know, our mandate has always been 20%, but we've heard through great advocacy, advocacy groups like ACORN that there's a pressing need for deeper affordability. And between now and December 2020, that is collectively what we're working towards, working towards a package that not only has our baseline of 20%, but makes accommodations through working with our government partners, through layering in subsidies, to finding other ways to deepen that level of affordability. And like we said in that letter, that idea of housing in perpetuity is key to making this work. That is housing indef affordable indefinitely. Next question, Clyde. Um, I have a two-part question. Um, the first one, first part of it is that Right from the beginning, the relationship between Waterfront Toronto and Sidewalk Labs has been murky and unclear, at least to us. And um, issues that were resolved through alignment issues were issues that should have been clear right from the beginning, and it's not clear why they required a long period of negotiation to establish that Waterfront Toronto is the person making, or the uh, entity making the RFP, and Sidewalk is supposed to make a proposal. Uh, but we, it, out of the new, new, uh, you know, uh, Halloween has been referred to a Halloween agreement. What is suggested is that it's the first stage. It was reported here today as the first stage. But I also heard an answer saying something to the effect of, "Well, it's really only the uh, the uh, 12 acres, and there is no next stage because the, you know Waterfront Toronto can't deal with these things." And it's not at all clear to me what is the relationship between is is anything being promised to Sidewalk by saying it's the first stage. And if, and if not, why not, et, et cetera. That's the first part of the question. The second part, related in terms of what is unclear, you have a plan that for, uh, that's been, you know, 1,500 page plan. A lot of it is just general statements, very little real detail. You now are done, you're gonna reduce that to 12 uh, acres. You've got between now and January to put together a new plan, apparently. That plan would then be presented for how long? I don't know, maybe a month or a month and a half before it would have to be evaluated and then go to the, the board. What is there that, me, that means you can actually have a substantial plan and a proper consultation in the time frame you presented? Okay, so let's start with the second one. That was a good, uh, that was a, a good chunk. Um, so do you, have enough, what are you gonna, do you have enough time to figure out what you're gonna evaluate, evaluate it and consult the public on it and then get to the board by March. I think that was also a question that maybe came from your table on the wall. So let's start with that and then we may have to go back to the first one around lack of clarity, but don't say it now. Let's get the first, this second part done first. So three months, uh, figure out what to evaluate, evaluate it, consult on it, 
and make a meaningful decision at the board. Do you, how do you think that that's enough time? So we have had the MIDP since uh, June. Um, we've already been reviewing and reading and assessing, and we started our evaluation November the 1st, um, and we will have that the technical component of that finished um, taking into account the threshold issues by um, early December. So from that, we will have eliminated a whole bunch of things. And I realized that slide that was up there with the squares was pretty complicated. Um, we will have already taken a whole bunch of things off the table, and we will only be going after the things or suggesting that we pursue the things that meet our objectives, right? So that list will be smaller by mid-December, and then we will be bringing that to you in January. And I think, Nicole, we have three, uh, at th pr we're proposing three meetings in January with the public, um, and that we would get your feedback, and then we would do um, uh, a revision based on the feedback that we've got. It's very tight. Everything about this project has been um, you know, tight timelines because I think somebody asked the question, how do you keep the private sector at the table if you're not showing momentum? So that's part of the pressure, but also, um, you know, we want to we wanna get to a place where we can um, either fish or cut bait. So we either we're going to make a decision or we're going to move on. So before re reiterating the first question, let me just see if I got it. You said that there was a lack of clarity around um, what Waterfront Toronto uh, well, okay, go ahead. Do it again. I tried to remember every single well, word, but it took a long on, time. On the second part of the question, it, it well, suge the answer suggests that you're just going to pair out of what's there already and present that. That's what the way I heard you, what you just said. She's it's not really developing a new plan. It's not really developing anything. It's just pairing out various things. Is that correct? And then we get one month of consultation on that? Okay. She's, she's no. I, 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 She's I'm nodding not, for everybody yeah. that can't see her sitting down over there. Yes, there's nothing new. It's a pare down of that's right okay. um, of the what's second, there. The second question, well, the first part was the the relate the true relationship between Waterfront Toronto and Sidewalk Labs. What is the real nature of it? And I and the, I'm focusing the question around. This is supposed to be the first stage, according to the the agreement on October 31st. It's not, you know, it's focusing on 12 acres, but it's, it's the first stage, as the first stage that was presented here today. Um, you had to go through this long process of apparently, you know, reestablishing with Sidewalk Labs who they really are in this process, presumably. You've made a commitment about, you know, toward in the future on some level, vague as, as it is, but you also say that it's not really a commitment because it's out of your hands, and I'm not really clear what's happening here. Okay, yeah. so what's the relationship between Waterfront Toronto and Sidewalk Labs exactly, and where does your mandate start and stop? And when you're specifically, it gets confusing when you speak to the future where you are or you are not um, within your mandate to take an action. Right, so let me go back to, you know, they were the successful uh, proponent in the RFP. Uh, we were negotiating to see, to get the details. The, the scope of what they presented clearly presented a problem to uh, the Waterfront Toronto Board and to governments. That's why the threshold letter, the open letter, came out from Steve. That was a new uh, intervention that we had to get through. So now the next stage is to continue the discussions to define that project more specifically, to look at what are the bundle of public goods that we collectively think, uh, with some expert advice in terms of the viability of some of these, what would that bundle look like that's what we want to bring to consultation, bring it to the board. Um, so that's dealing with the 12 acres. We've been you know, up front again that uh, the rest of that has been kind of dismissed from our conversation. That'll be a conversation that they have, along with other proponents for any lands that the city may want to develop in the future. Okay, so uh, where were we just now? Where, who just went? You did, so we're going back to Matthew. We've got a system here. I'm just making sure we cooperate through it. Matthew, Yulia, then I'm gonna come, we had a hand up a long time ago over here, and then we'll go to Cly. Go ahead. So my question is, uh, this parliament gonna be a minority, and there's a possibility we're gonna have another election in 18 months, and how are you guys gonna deal with this political uncertainty? I mean, I spoke with a couple of uh, conservative MPs, still they not convinced about the sidewalk lab, the idea. So it, what if like if the government changes and whole things gonna be changed whole again, how are you gonna deal with uh, this political uncertainty? 
George, you're from the yeah, province. So I'm gonna Talk jump. about political yeah. uncertainty. <laughs> so uh, there's always uncertainty. Uh, we're going to, you know, we have a board. Uh, that board will make uh, decisions based on the information we present. Um, governments will feed in any concerns that they have prior to the decision being made by the board. And we'll, you know, live with whatever the decisions that are comfortably being made by the board. Uh, and they may agree to withdraw. They may agree to continue. Um, but the agreement to continue would probably have conditions that governments would want addressed. All right, next question, right here. Hi there, my name is Ian. Um, first off, thank you so much for responding to all these questions. I know it's hard on a Tuesday and all. Um, but this admiration, I guess, it sort of feeds into um, your whole thing with like the licensing and the uh, ethics and all. My uh, home city, Hong Kong, is currently embroiled in some stuff regarding that. And, um, you know, despite all your protections, I fear that, like, it's not enough because Google's ecosystem is, like, always open anyways. So even if you have end licensing, like, like words and things like that to assuage those fears, I fear it won't be enough. And people will still find a way to use the innovations here, and Toronto will be the source of all that. So. My second thing, too, also, um, in terms of data values, narrowing it down to the individual, is that actually necessary for planning, or are you going to have more aggregate values? Because, um, yeah. So a couple of things. If the first point we take extraordinarily seriously, and that's something that is part of how we're thinking about this project. And there's no perfect answer that I think Waterfront Toronto can give to you today on those issues, and it's bigger than Waterfront Toronto. And certainly our government partners need to be a part of the solution to those concerns. Um, around the data piece, looking at the individual is one element, but it's not a requirement. So a lot of the data could simply be aggregated. It could be synthetic. It doesn't have to be based on an individual person and their data as they work through the actual development site. So we're looking at all of those different models, not just with Sidewalk, but thinking about the other solutions that may come into play. So it is a part of the conversation that we're having around the, the topics. It's something that the, the DSAP, the Digital Strategy Advisory Panel, has also been looking at, particularly around some of the equity issues, that they're looking at how data actually affects equity issues and inclusivity issues. Um, and when you start to deal with the individuals who are there, you might actually be missing some of the underrepresented groups. So there's much of that conversation that's, that's happening, and certainly I'd be happy to have a further conversation with you on it. I'd just like to add, too, sorry, one more thing. Um, in terms of tying the data system throughout the city, is it going to be heavily centralized, or would you decentralize it through existing city infrastructure, like okay. libraries even? Or So that's part of what we need to think about moving forward in terms of the architecture of what that may look like. Some of the systems may actually need to nest within city systems. Others, you know, private developers have digital systems that are working within their developments right now, and those are very decentralized. Um, some of the digital inclusion programs that we do, some of them are here at the waterfront, some of them are run through other civic institutions. The library is one of the ones obviously we deeply respect and, and do want to work with on this project. Um, the notion of the data trust, there were some thoughts about whether that should be held at the library or whether it would be an academic institution. So sort of the, the notion of the broader public sector, civil society, what role do they play in the project moving forward as part of what Waterfront Toronto needs to work on if the project moves forward. Thank okay, you. next question here. Yes, and I'm going to bring up something that's brought up, but I just really want to go back to the basics. When we first arrived here today, we were welcomed by the local councillor that wanted to remind us that this was all about taking back our waterfront and from a report that was written in the, in the year 2000. And what I want to say to Waterfront Toronto and the three partners is that innovation seems to be a limited concept. What the citizens, and that's us in the room, and, though, and they live in this city, and we are going to endure, and the future generations will see what happens on this piece of land. The innovations we're looking for is real affordable housing, decent pacing, paying jobs, a zero carbon footprint, a link with the public sector education institutions so that the tech will go on and benefit the future generations. We are looking for those kind of things as innovations, not just technological problems. And the last thing I want to say is, it's been fascinating that the concept of who owns the data has been the focus. 
And yet, what is never, I have never heard discussed is how is this project going to increase democracy for the citizens that will live there and for the citizens of our great city. It's not about the data. It should be more about the democracy and decision making going forward. I thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to have a question right here. Um, my question was about uh, a patent pledge that um, someone had mentioned earlier that uh, other data providers would have to, I, I guess, pledge something in order to, I'm not really sure what that meant, what the data, what this patent yeah. pledge is about. And I hear the word pledge a lot when um, we're talking about waterfront, talking about the Sidewalk Labs community. So there's two elements to it. There's the intelligent community guidelines that would apply that would go you know, above and beyond the typical protections that would be available through legislation and regulation. And any proponent that would do work within the waterfront would have to adhere to those. So that's one piece of it. The patent pledge is actually something that companies could voluntarily opt into to benefit from the intellectual property developed by Sidewalk or others within the sort of pledge agreement. It's a, a mechanism around managing intellectual property that exists not just through this project, but there's other jurisdictions that have a patent pledge. And it's really um, a legal provision to ensure that you can develop without fear of having an assertion against you or a future litigation against you for using the intellectual property in that patent. So it's a fully optional piece should a company want to benefit, let's say, and this is just by way of an example, the, the core infrastructure that might be in the dynamic curb technology, if you wanted to then take that and develop uh, a dynamic pathway within an enclosed area. You know, you could take that as a Canadian company and do that without sidewalk saying, well, you took our curb technology and have now used it and therefore I'm going to sue you. So it helps to prevent that from happening. But it isn't something that's mandatory. A company could keep their technology proprietary should they choose to do so. They don't have to expose themselves to sidewalk. Just one quick follow-up. Yeah, sure. Um, well, if they did keep it proprietary and it broke, mm -hmm. who's res how would we get to be able to fix it? It, so that's a slightly different issue, and that gets back to what Meg had talked about when it came to the remedies and backstops in terms of performance. Um, and in some cases, we actually not just have those remedies and backstops so that we could actually pay for repair or replacement. We actually uh, have a model, too, in one other instance where we have a step-in provision where an alternate provider can come in and, and deliver that service, not through the Keyside project. This is something else that Waterfront Toronto does, but this is a precedent of how we've looked at the situation around performance and vulnerability and ensuring that, that the systems, core systems, continue to function in the neighborhoods that we're building. Okay, next question here, and uh, we're going to wrap up uh, right at nine, so we're going to take two or three more, um, and then we'll be done. Any questions you leave on your table, we will document, um, and uh, Waterfront Toronto has committed to answering, so we're going to type them all up and leave them, please, for us. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, my question's regarding the second round of consultations. So how is Waterfront Toronto going to make sure that they prioritize the voices of more marginalized groups, especially indigenous groups. I know the Mississaugas of the new Credit First Nation were briefly brought up at the beginning of tonight. However, Toronto's indigenous population consists of people from all across Turtle Island and how will we make sure that their voices are heard and that the feedback is properly taken and processed? Yeah, no, uh, that's a very fair question. So we've, uh talk to Ms. Suggs of the credit therein, but we are talking about the urban, uh, large urban indigenous groups. Uh, they are being engaged. We've engaged uh, the province who helped facilitate some of this and we will continue those dialogues. Uh, so we've had dialogues already. In fact, we're developing an MOU with one of the groups, uh, but we're committed to doing that as part of the consultation. Okay. Yeah, I've been listening to a lot of confusion, and I think it's the terminology. I have an observation. People are concerned. We're going to do an evaluation. How can you do it in two or three months? We're going to have a plan, but then we're not. I think, in fact, what I understand you to be doing is you are taking all those ideas, you are assessing them by that rubric cube, and then you are going to cull them in a cone and come forth, not with a plan, but with the distilled ideas that you've assessed, not evaluated by your framework. Am I correct? Yeah, yes, that's correct. Thank you for that clarity. Then I would suggest clarity of language is crucial. You talk about it all the time. Most of us drop yeah, in. No, that's a good point. 
spend a lot of time getting confused because you are not evaluating, you are not developing a plan. Make it simple. We could give a lot better input at the end. Okay, thank you. Okay, over there and then coming right here. Hi. Um, I just wanted to know, uh, do we know if Sidewalk Labs has monetized any of the opportunities uh, they've come across the past two years being in Toronto? And uh, if so, how, what's the process uh, in terms of the gain for uh, Toronto in this early stage of, of opportunities? So has Sidewalk Labs monetized anything that they've come up with here in the last couple of years? And then what's the process if they, if they have? So to the best of my knowledge, they have not taken information that they've, they've gathered directly from Toronto and monetized it elsewhere yet. That is something that is part of the revenue sharing model that we have put forward. Uh, in terms of anything that's developed through the Toronto opportunity and through this, this is what we would call sort of site-specific IP and co-created IP in some cases. So that is actually, that, that value would be able to be captured and reinvested into the, the public sector. But to the best of our knowledge, there hasn't been another situation where they've taken information directly derived from this project, monetized it, and moved it elsewhere into another solution. Okay, next question. Uh, it's not a question, it's a comment. Uh, I just wanted to thank Waterfront Toronto for this process. We've been watching this for the last two years. As a matter of fact, I think it was two years ago this week that we were sitting at St. Lawrence Center for the Arts uh, having the first conversation with Dan. Um, I often talk about this proposal as a very uh, comparator to East Bayfront. And so when East Bayfront, when Waterfront uh, Toronto put out that proposal, it was for 13 acres, not 12. And it was awarded to an American company. And there were some innovations that were involved. So I think that for this, um, I think it's great that the public has had a chance to be sort of like a bird on the wire to watch this process. We've never seen anything like this in the world. And I'm hoping that we can continue to work on this because for once, I would love it if the city of Toronto could be seen as a leader and not a lagger. There's a lot of opportunities here for us to stitch together the technology that's already being used throughout the world. But I think now we can continue working um, with Sidewalk and asking better questions. I think that it's not just about the data and the privacy, and I just say, thank goodness, we have Chantal Bernier on board. She's got the biggest brain I know when it comes to this. But there's lots of other opportunities as well. So I just wanted to say, carry on, and I'm looking forward to seeing what's happening in January. OK, um, I've got five to nine. Um, everybody that has their hand up still, I think, already had a chance to, to make a question. I haven't gone to anybody twice. So what I'd like to do is call it. And what we will say is that all of the notes, um, we've been taking diligent notes. We're going to take photos of the wall. We're going to type everything on the wall. We're going to type everything you leave us on the table. And you will get, as always from us, a draft summary of the meeting today. I'm going to turn it over to the Waterfront team to say thanks. Um, but on behalf of our team, uh, thank you very much. And we'll turn it to Meg. Okay, thanks everybody for coming. Um, you know, it's important to us that you're willing to come out and share your personal time with us. And we are listening and we are um, including this in our evaluations and the work going forward. So thank you very much for coming tonight.